they come to the point of judging even God. Yet are those judging everyone and everything new to this generation, or has it always been this way? No, it was not like that in the old days. This is the spirit of our times. Nowadays, they will not only judge laymen, politicians, and church leaders, they will also judge the saints, and have come to the point of judging even God. God, they will say, did not act right in that case. He should have acted this way. Can you believe it? But, my son, how can you tell God what to do? I object. Why can't I, he replies. This is what I think. They don't realize the degree of their impudence. This secular spirit has de destroyed so many good things. Evil begins this way and slowly turns into blasphemy. They pass judgment on God and don't mind in the least that their thoughts may be blasphemous. And there are some among them who, being tall and able to reason a bit, will start criticizing. This boy here is so short, a mere handful. That fellow walks crooked. One does this, the other does that. They don't care about anyone. A man came once to my cell and had some point said to me about something. God should not have made it this way. Can you keep a pebble suspended in the midair, I asked him. Those stars you see up there are not sparkling beads. They are huge masses in space that move with dizzying speed and yet do not collide. He insisted, but in my opinion, God should not have arranged it that way. Can you believe the man? Are we the ones to judge God? Logic is everywhere and trust in God is nowhere to be found. And if you try to talk senses to these people, they will say, Excuse me, all I did is give you my opinion. Don't I have the right to do that? The things that God hears from us, fortunately, he doesn't take us at our word. According to the Old Testament, God told the Israelites that when they entered Canaan, they should destroy everybody who lived there. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 2. God must have something in mind, but they thought otherwise. That's not very humane. We should let them live. Let's not kill them. But then they were lured to immortality and idolatry and started sacrificing their sons and daughters to idols, as we read in the psalm. Psalm 106, verse 37, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. To continue. God knows what he is doing, but there will always be those who are insolent enough to ask, why should God have created hell? So people start criticizing, and once that happens, our spiritual life is depleted. The grace of God is gone, and our understanding cannot go any deeper, and come to realize why God acted in a certain way. To merely ask why is to be judgmental, full of pride and egoism. Yet and some people, young people ask us, why did Christ have to be crucified? Couldn't God have saved the world another way? But God chose to save the world in this way, and they are still not moved. Imagine if he had chosen some other means. And then there are those who say, nothing happened to God himself. It was his son who was sacrificed. As I see it, a father would rather sacrifice his life than see his child sacrificed. It is more painful for a father to face his child's death than to face his own. How can you begin to persuade them? These people don't understand what love is. Someone else asked me, Adam had two sons, Abel and Cain. How did Cain's wife get there? But if one should read a little further in the Old Testament, it says clearly that after Seth, Adam had other sons and daughters. Genesis 5.4 Cain had left his home and wandered in the mountains after his brother's murder and did not know that the wife he took was actually his sister. God provided that men should descend from one tribe to prevent malice and crime. This, th this way they would reason, we all come from the same father and mother, Adam and Eve. And perhaps this thought would 
put the brake on human malice. But that's not what happened. Our world is full of malice. The things I must put up with from people who come to see me at my cell. I tell them I have a headache and I can't get any aspirin around here. So they go away unhappy. They won't understand why I would say such a thing to them and so they complain, we went into so much trouble to get here and now he tells us that he has a headache? And then there are those who will ask me, should we go get you some aspirin? Impudence repels divine grace. We need to be very careful. Unruly and careless behavior stands in the way of divine grace. It's the greatest obstacle. Where there is lack of respect, the grace of God will not approach. The more respect young people have to parents, teachers, and elders in general, the more grace God will pour on them. But if they are unruly and rebellious, then the grace of God will abandon them. Secular freedom has driven away both piety and common courtesy. Some young men will come to my cell and call out to their father, Hey, Dad, do you have any cigarettes? I ran out of mine. You would not hear such a thing in the old days. The few boys that smoked did so secretly. Now, no one sees anything wrong with it. How can the grace of God still remain with them? Today, there are some young women who will use the filthiest language you can imagine to insult their brothers for going to church and being religious, and they will do that in front of their father and mother, and the father will say nothing. I was so upset when I heard this that I started mumbling to myself when I was left alone. Today, children are destroyed by two things. First, the secular world in which we live, Secondly, the fact that their parents are also largely secular. This secular environment has a great impact. Only a few children will be reserved and show philotimo and sacrificial love. Audacity makes children unmanageable. Parents will bring their children to me and say, Father, my child is possessed. And I see that the children, God forbid, do not have a demon. Possession is a rare thing. Most of them suffer from an external demonic influence. In other words, the demon actually rules their life, not from inside, but from the outside. But even in this way, he manages to get the job done. And how does it all start? It starts from impudence and audacity. When children begin to speak to adults with audacity, they drive God's grace away. And when God's grace departs, the demons get to work. Children become rowdy and get into all kinds of mischief. But take children who have reverence and respect, who listen to their parents, their teachers, and their elders, and you will see that they are full of grace and blessed by God. God's grace protects and shelters them. Where there is great reverence for God and respect for one's elders, divine grace comes and fills the soul making it all aglow and ob obvious by the radiating light. But don't expect the grace of God to go to unruly children, only to those who have philotimo, who have respect and reverence. And it is not difficult to identify such children. One look at their eyes and you will see how bright they are. And the greater the respect they have for their parents and elders, the greater the grace of God. But God's grace will not rest in unruly children. A child that is constantly issuing demands, no, I don't want this, I want that, will end up a rebel, a devil. That's what Lucifer also wanted, to place his throne above the throne of God. Just look around and you'll see that those children whose parents cater to their every demand grow up to be rebels. If these children do not repent and get rid of the deadly wave that is thrashing them on all sides, if they go on behaving with audacity, then God forbid they will be twice abandoned. They will reach a point where they will blaspheme against God, and when that happens, the evil spirits will come and rule their lives. Honor thy father and thy mother. 
Exodus 20, verse 12. Look at where children are today. They will take no advice, no discipline of any kind, and they certainly will not take a slap or two here and there. Instead of respect, they are full of egoism and nerves. The freedom they have, they abuse. A child will tell his parents, I will call the police on you. Recently, a 15-year-old boy did something that was very wrong and his father slapped him. The boy went and sued his father and the case went to trial. At the trial, the father said, You are committing an injustice against me because if I had not slapped my son, then he would have been in prison now and it would not be you hurting but me. At that point, he got up, slapped the boy twice, and said to the court, You should try me for slapping him now, but not for slapping him before. Go ahead, put me in jail, because this time I had no reason to slap him. My point is that the things have gotten out of hand. In the old days, our parents would scold us, give us a slap or two, now and then, but no bad thought ever came through our minds. We accepted being slapped, as we accepted being caressed, without reacting and trying to figure out whether the wrong we did was great or small. We believed that they spanked us for our own good. We knew that our parents loved us, and sometimes they would caress us, sometimes they would kiss us, and sometimes they would slap us. For the slaps, the caresses, and the kisses of parents are all given out of love. When parents discipline their children, their heart suffers. When children get a slap, it's only their cheek that hurts. And we all know that the pain of the heart is greater than the pain of the cheek. Whatever a mother might do, whether she reprimands, spanks, or caresses her children, will always come from her heart. She will always act of maternal love. But when children will not realize this and speak with audacity, when they object to everything you tell them and act stubbornly, then they will drive God's grace that is in them away. And then, as is to be expected, they will be vulnerable to the influence of demons. Yerunda, aren't some parents incompetent? Yes, but God will not abandon their children. God is not unjust. The wild pear trees are full of wild pears. On the way to my cell, there's a wild crab apple tree. So full of fruit is this tree that one cannot see the leaves, and the branches break from the weight. But take a look at cultivated crabapple trees that are regularly sprayed, and I doubt that you will see a trace of fruit on them. Generation Gap The world has turned into a madhouse. Small children go to bed at midnight, when they should be fast asleep by sunset. They are locked up in apartment buildings, surrounded by concrete, and they have to follow an adult schedule. What are they supposed to do? Children are stuck one way and parents another. Young people come and tell me, our parents don't understand us. Parents come and say the same thing, our children don't understand us. There is a growing gap between them which will not disappear until children put themselves in the place of their parents and parents do the same with their children. Children who do not cause their parents pain will not suffer in the hands of their children when they become parents. The spiritual laws at work ensure that the reverse is also true. Children who are troublemakers will one day suffer the same in the hands of their children. Yet under some peop young people claim that they have been harmed by their parents' love. They are not right. When a child has philotimo, it cannot be harmed by the parent's love. But if he takes advantage of it, then that will ruin him. Only an impaired child can be harmed by the love of his parents. Instead of being grateful to God for his parents, for their love, he is upset because they are kind and good to him. When there are young people out there who have no parents, no one to care for them. I don't know what to tell you. When a child does not recognize his parents as his benefactors and does not love them, especially when the parents are God-fearing people, how will he be able to respect and love God, the great benefactor and father of all human beings, a reality that is far more difficult for him to grasp? 
Chapter 5 Internal Disorder and External Appearance Secular people put on what they carry inside. Yet under give me a blessing. I pray for you to become a spiritual clown like St. Isadora, the fool for Christ's sake, and gain the good kind of hypocrisy. Footnote, St. Isadora lived in the monastery of Tabernicians, which was founded in the beginning of the 4th century by St. Pacomius. She pretended to be a fool for Christ's sake and would ridicule herself. Instead of the nun's veil, she would wear a rag on her head and never put on any shoes. She never complained or insulted anyone despite the fact she received insults and beatings many times. The sanctity of her life was revealed to the great ascetic Peturion in a vision. He visited the monastery and disclosed before the entire sisterhood that Isadora, whom they considered crazy, was in fact an ama, that is, a spiritual mother. To continue, you see every day the poor souls that live in the world celebrate their secular hypocrisy. They put on costumes based on what they have in their heart. In the old days, people would dress in costumes so as to look like a different person and so on, only for the carnival, once a year, just before Great Lent. Nowadays, most have some kind of costume on. It's a daily spectacle. Each person will dress as his own mind tells him. People have become really strange. They are fools. Few are the people, men or women or children, who are modest and decent. Women, especially, are in the worst shape. Today on my way to town I saw a woman wearing a very wide ribbon like a bandage on her head, very tall boots, and a short dress. This is the latest fashion, someone explained. Some women will wear shoes with heels that are so thin that one misstep will send them to the orthopedic surgeon. As for the hair, don't even ask. Another woman, may God forgive me. I don't know if she was a human. She had this wild face with red glaring eyes, smoking a cigarette and puffing the smoke in and out. These days many say that they have this rule not to smoke at home if they have children. That's good, but in the meantime, so many children are born like smoked herrings. Coffee will also make people act strange. Observe their faces and you'll see all kinds of grimaces. God's grace has left them. They are totally abandoned. I remember when I was at Mount Sinai Monastery, things were getting out of hand. It was just as bad. The sight of female tourists visiting the monasteries would give me so much pain. They looked awful. It was like seeing beautiful Byzantine icons thrown in the garbage can, except in this case they had put themselves there. Once I saw a woman wearing something like a cape, and I said to myself, Thank God, here's one who is wearing something decent, whatever it may be. At least she is not like the others. But when she turned around, I realized it was all open in the front. Where's this world coming to? Once they sent me a picture of a bride and asked me to pray that her marriage would be a good one. She was wearing this awful wedding gown. When they dressed this way, they're showing irreverence to the mystery of marriage and to the church whose space is sacred. These are supposedly spiritual people, and yet they don't seem to think twice about their dress. What will those who are not spiritual do if they follow their example? That's why I am saying that if monasteries do not hold the line, no one else will put the brakes on people. They are out of control. In the old days when we had the fools for Christ's sake, there were very few crazy people in the world. Perhaps we should pray to those who have been fools for Christ's sake to heal today's natural fools and help them become fools for Christ. At any rate, today one can hear and see the strangest things. Someone told me, and I, I crossed myself when I heard it, that the fashion these days is to wear patched clothes. It's the work of young people who have nothing better to do so they rub their clothes, wear them down here and there, and then they cut them and sew rough patches on them. Now, that is natural in a hard-working man, 
but it does not make sense in someone who is lying around all day. And the man went on, Let me tell you, Yerundu, about another case that is even more bizarre. My wife ran into the son of a family friend in Ammonia Square in Athens, and the young man was wearing a pair of pants torn in the back. Dear, she said, put your hand in the back. Get off my case, the young man replied. That's the fashion, poor souls. Is it correct, Yerundu, for people to wear T-shirts with pictures of saints on them. If the picture is on a t-shirt or jacket, it is fine. It does not do any harm. It's actually better than putting the picture of the devil. But if the picture of a saint is printed on the pants, it's inappropriate. That's impiety. There are some pious people who will do this with their clothes. When the patriarch Demetrios visited the United States, they made t-shirts with his picture on them and a picture of the church of Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. Was it out of piety that they did that? What else? They were Orthodox Christians, after all, not Jews or Muslims and so on. There are people out there who will do the right thing, just like there are good and bad doctors. Yerund, is some of the disorder that we see around us caused by foreign influence? Well, where else would it come from? This is why in my days they used to say about people, what do you expect? They are from Smyrna. Well, Smyrna was a seaside city visited by many foreigners. St. Arsenios was very strict about such matters. There was a newly wed bride in Farasa who wore a very provocative colorful scarf in this Smyrna style. The saint reprimanded her repeatedly, telling her to throw it away and dress modestly like the rest of the women in Farasa. But she would not listen. One day when St. Arsenios saw her wearing the same scarf, he told her in a strict tone, I do not want Frankish diseases in Farasa. Be warned that if you don't do as, I, as you're told, the children you bear will not live long after they are baptized. They will become angels, and you will not enjoy any of them. But she did not heed to St. Arsenios's warning, and indeed she lost two of her little angels. Only then did she come to her senses, threw away the multicolored scarf, and went to St. Arsenios to ask for forgiveness. Yet under, does wearing dark-colored clothes help someone who wants to be a monk in his spiritual life? Yes, they are of great help. When we wear dark-colored clothes, it's easier to detach ourselves from the world, whereas colorful clothing keeps us attached. Now, if someone were to say, I will wait and put on black clothes when I get to the monastery, or I will wait and observe the monastic rule when I am there, he won't amount to much. Black will be the color of his achievements. One who, while living in the world, will gladly adopt the monastic rule and will desire it with all his heart. This person will experience spiritual joy both in this world and later when he becomes a monk. He will ascend the rungs of the spiritual ladder faster than most. Sometimes yet the religious people, young people who dress decently, meet great opposition from adults. If they have faith and dress this way because their heart tells them, they may end up correcting the adults, putting them in their proper place. I had known a girl who wore black clothes with long sleeves down to her wrists. That's how pious she was. Once an elderly woman, dressed in modern style, said to her, Aren't you ashamed at your age to be dressed in black and wearing long sleeves? Since you are not setting the example for us, the young woman replied, we are trying to set the example ourselves. And with these words, she put her in her place. There is more. Nowadays, recently, widowed women will not hesitate to wear colorful clothes, but what can you say? My sister became a widow at 23 and remained a widow until her death and always wore black. As I see it, those widows who have worn black in this life, even involuntarily, and who live a white spiritual life, praising God without complaining, are more blessed than those poor souls who wear colorful clothing and lead a colorful, loose life.
Today you cannot tell a man from a woman. Once, to test the wise Solomon, they presented him with a group of boys and a group of girls identically dressed to see if he could tell them apart. He led them to a fountain and asked them to wash their faces. He was able to tell the boys from the girls by watching the way they were washing their faces. The girls were throwing the water on their faces carefully and gently, while the boys were splashing it, making noise with their palms. Today, men are imitating women to such a degree that many times you cannot tell them apart. In the old days, you could tell a man from a woman from as far away as 500 meters. Nowadays, it's difficult to tell them apart, even up close. Is it a man, you wonder, or is it a woman? This is, as prophecy goes, that a time will come when we will not be able to tell the difference between men and women. The elder Arsenios, footnote, the elder Arsenios of Speliotis from 1886 to 1983 was an ascetic monk who lived in the caves of St. Anna area of Holy Mountain. To continue, the young Arsenios told a young man whose hair was waist long, Well now, what exactly are you, a man or a woman? He couldn't tell. In the old days, they used to give haircuts to the visitors of the Holy Mountain. Now, they let them come any way they want. I give them a haircut with the scissors I use to cut the wool when I make komboskini. I have given many haircuts behind the altar of the church. When long-haired men come, I tell them, I have promised some bald friends of mine that I will give them their hair back. For love's sake, then please let me cut your hair. What can I do? I have given them my word. Do they accept it, Yaranda? It makes a difference how one speaks to them. I don't tell them, you look awful. Aren't you ashamed of yourselves? Don't you respect this sacred place? Instead, I say, you know, fellows, that long hair of yours is an insult to your manliness. What would you think if you saw a National Guardsman in Ammonia Square carrying a woman's purse? Is there a way the two can fit? Let's get rid of the hair. And I go ahead and give them a haircut. Do you know how much hair I have collected? If someone is reluctant and asks for the reason, I say to him, what do you mean, why? I am a monk, right? It's my job to make tonsures. It's how you say something that makes the difference. They start laughing and that's where it all ends. After all, I only give them a haircut. I am not changing their names. Only once I named someone Axion Estine because at that time I was cutting his hair. A procession was passing by with the famous holy icon of Axion Estine. Footnote. Axion Estine refers to the icon of the Theotokos, which is called Axion Estine. According to tradition, it was in front of this historical icon that the Archangel Gabriel taught the hymn, quote, It is truly meet to bless thee, the Theotokos, to a monk in the 10th century. Later, the Archangel Gabriel engraved the hymn on a slate at the request of the monk. The naming of the holy icon is due to this occurrence and is the feast commemorating the event. To continue. Oh, how parents rejoice when I cut their son's long hair. Do you know how many thank you notes I get from parents, especially from mothers? From this alone, God will forgive me. Nowadays, the fashion is to cut the hair short and leave a tail in the back. Now, can you boys tell me what's the meaning of this tail? I sometimes ask, and you know what they say? We do it for drawing attention. You're wasting your time, I reply. People today have so many problems that they will not even notice you. You'll see full-grown, robust young men wearing earrings. You should see all the earrings I have removed. Yet under some young men will wear only one earring. It's the anarchists that do that. The single earring symbolizes anarchy. They don't do it because they are effeminate. They pierce their ear and put an earring as a sign of resistance. Once a 22-year-old fellow, long hair, a beard, and one earring came to my cell with his father. 
This earring, I told him, does not look good on you. I know what it means, but many people don't, and they might misunderstand you. The fellow took it off and handed it to me. It was a gold earring. Give it to a jeweler to make you a little cross, I said to him. Others, he added, will wear a ring on their nose. This means that the devil has put the ring on them and leads them by the nose. Of course, the reins are not visible. Others wear layers and layers of white golden chains around their neck. Once I gave such a young fellow a thorough reprimand. After I removed the chains from his neck, I said to him, Go, give them to an orphan, or give them to your mother, or go find someone who is poor and give them to him. He came to his senses and asked me, What must I do, Father? Start by wearing one chain with a small cross. I said, Can you imagine men wearing this kind of jewelry, wide gold, two, three layers? Even princesses do not carry so much gold around their neck. Then they come and tell you that they have problems. The problem is right there on their neck. So I have a canona, a holy rule on this matter too. In some cases, I myself will take the jewelry away. In others, I tell them to give it away themselves. These young people have no sense of modernization whatsoever. They've lost it altogether. Some have those zodiac signs hanging around their neck. I asked a young man, What's that? I have not seen anything like it before. It's my zodiac sign, he replied. I thought perhaps it was a panagia. Are you wearing an animal sign because you are some kind of animal? I asked him. It's one crazy thing after another. All the inner disorder comes to the surface. We must pray all the time that God will enlighten our young people so that some yeast may be spared for the future. People are thirsting for simplicity. The good thing is that people are thirsting for simplicity and have reached the point of turning simplicity into a fashion, even though they may not feel simple. Some come to the holy mountain with washed out and shabby clothes. I say to myself, these people do not work in the fields. Why do they dress this way? Take someone who speaks like a villager because he comes from a village and that's his accent. You enjoy hearing him for this reason. It's natural. But when someone is faking the accent, you feel like throwing up. Then you have some visitors who come dressed in ties. We go from the one extreme to the other. One person had six or seven ties with him. Once a man was putting on a suit and a tie, and someone asked him why he was dressing up. I am going to see Father Paisios, he said. So why are you dressing up like that? Because I want to honor him, was his answer. Oh, now we're in trouble. The reason we see so much rebellion around us is because true simplicity is absent. When spiritual people do not live a truly simple life and don't open up, they cannot help our youth. That's why you see them acting like hooligans. They have nothing better to imitate. When young people see Christians being stiff, suit and tie on, all coming out of the same mold, they see no difference between them and those secular ones living in the world. Naturally, they rebel. If they could see the good simplicity in spiritual people, they would not have reached this point. But now the young are guided by secular norms and so are religious people. This is the way Christians are supposed to walk and this is the way they are supposed to do this and that. That's all that you hear from them. And they don't behave this way out of true reverence, no. They do it because it's our duty. This is why young people react and say, what nonsense is this? How can they go to church all stiff and buttoned up? Forget it. I'm getting out of here. And start taking off everything and going around naked. Don't you see? They go from one extreme to the other. It's all a reaction. They have values and ideals, but no models to emulate. I feel so sorry for them. This is why it's so important to arouse their philotimo, their sense of self-sacrifice, to move them with the simplicity of our lives. 
if they see priests and those they consider spiritual people attempt to restrain them with the ways of this world, they will be indignant. But if they encounter unassuming modesty, simplicity, and sincerity, they will begin to question their lives. For when we are sincere and do not attach importance to ourselves, we are thus authentically simple persons with humility. All this provides peace for the person himself, but is also noticed and appreciated by others. You see, people can tell if you really feel their pain. They know right away when you are pretending. Take any bum from the street. He is a better man than a Christian who is a hypocrite. For this reason, never give people a fake smile, but always be natural. Avoid malice and hypocrisy. Be full of love and sincerity. For me, it's far more important that we have the good kind of order in our inner lives. I am really moved when I see respect and true love, when the person behaves simply and avoids formalities. For otherwise, when it's all a front, we end up being human only in appearance. We put on a show like a carnival clown. The soul of a true human being is beautiful, full of inner purity, and this beauty is not only present within the soul, but is carried over into one's appearance. The divine sweetness of God's love is so pervasive that we can see it on a person's face. Our soul's inner beauty will make us beautiful and holy inside and will even alter our appearance. We will be betrayed by the presence of God's grace in us, so that even if our clothing is poor and ugly, it will appear beautiful and holy to those who meet us. Father Tikhon used to sew his own monastic caps using the cloth from worn-out Rasos. The caps he made looked like bags, but when he wore them, they were full of grace. No matter how old or unkempt his clothes were, they looked beautiful because his soul had so much beauty. Once, a visitor photographed him wearing one of those, these loose and awkward caps on his head and a pajama top. A visitor who realized that father was feeling cold had thrown it over his shoulders. Everybody who sees this picture now is convinced that Father Tikhon is wearing a bishop's mandia, when in fact it's only a colorful pajama that he has on. People would approach even his rags with reverence and would take a piece for a blessing. Far greater is the worth of a single blessed man like Father Tikhon, who changed his inner man and thus became holy in appearance, than the worth of so many others who are constantly putting on new clothes and yet keep wearing the same man inside, buried under layers of sin. A woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man, nor shall a man put on a woman's garment. Deuteronomy 22 verse 5 A woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man nor shall a man put on a woman's garment, for whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. Yananda, how should we deal with women who come to the monastery in pants? They often claim that they are more practical and more decent than short dresses. These days it's either short dresses or pants. Doesn't the Old Testament say very clearly and with all these details, a man shall not wear a woman's garment, and a woman shall not wear a man's garment. It's the law of God, and on top of that, it's inappropriate. Men rarely, very rarely, wear dresses. Women who work in the fields, however, say that it is easier for them to do their job if they wear pants. These are excuses. Yet the mothers say that they dress their little girls in pants to keep them warm. Is this the only way that they can solve this problem? How about stockings? Can't they wear stockings or something else that will cover their legs and keep them warm? Where there is a will, there is a way. Yet under what should we do when dignitaries come and are accompanied by women wearing pants? You must explain to them, do you want us to make an exception, break a rule, and disrupt the order of our holy monastery? 
once yet under 30 high school teachers came wearing pants, and we let them go in. That was wrong. You should have told them, sorry, but it is the policy of the monastery not to allow entrance to women in pants. These women will then go to other monasteries and say, in such or such a monastery, they let us in with pants. You accommodated them because you did not want to insult them, but they will turn and insult you. Place a sign at the gate with the relevant passage from the Old Testament. Make 50 skirts and offer them politely to female visitors in in pants or short dresses who come for the first time and don't know the rules. Yet under what happens if a high school comes and all the girls are wearing pants? You should offer them a treat outside the gate. That will give them reason to think about the issue. Or if they call in advance to notify you of the visit, let them know that women are not allowed in if they wear pants. This way they will realize that they must show respect for this place. This is not a parish. It is the responsibility of the parish priest to educate women and explain why they should not be wearing pants and why it's important to conform to this rule. If at some point women from another parish visit his church wearing pants, he should try and take care of the problem, keeping in mind that the church is our mother. She is not a stepmother. But yet under many people say, with all these restrictions, you're actually driving people away from the church. Doesn't the Old Testament contain a commandment from God that forbids women to wear a man's clothing? What more do they want? But you see, there is more to this. First they start with, but why shouldn't women also wear pants? Then you'll hear, why shouldn't atheists be allowed to serve on the parish council, since it is the people who are the church? If they get their way, the fate of the church will be in the hands of atheists. They will start removing one thing after another, and in the end they will turn churches into libraries and warehouses. Why not remove this? Why not take away that? What can you say? When half-naked tourists come to the monastery, they should not be tolerated under the pretext of collecting money to help dress the poor. This is a scheme planned by the devil who wants to alienate the monk from God's blessings and make him indistinguishable from those who live in the world. For true wealth can be found only in the virtues we acquire when we leave the world and live in exile for the sake of Christ. Yeranda, when you were at Stomion Monastery, did you have to post signs for tourists? Sure, I had to. At the monastery, I put a sign which read, Welcome to the monastery. About 20 minutes down the road from the monastery, I put another sign which read, Those who are dressed indecently may head for the river Eus, footnote, River Eus flows below the Holy Monastery of Stomia in Kunitsa, with an arrow pointing in that direction. The third sign read, Those who are dressed decently can head for the monastery, with an arrow pointing toward the Holy Monastery. Wasn't that a good idea? What we must do, Yeranda, during the summer, when many women come with bare shoulders? Well, weave a shawl or something they can put over their shoulders. This way they'll realize that when they're on monastery grounds, they need to show reverence and respect. Cosmetics, smudges on the image of God. So many people today have taken up useless and vain activities. Take women, for instance. They put all these foul-smelling sprays on their hair. They are enough to give you an allergy. When I see a sophisticated worldly woman with her worldly looks and perfumes, my stomach turns. I was told once, so-and-so went to Germany to become a beautician. What is that? I asked. A beautician, they informed me, makes an old woman look young again. Then I remembered that I had actually seen an older woman who had a straight line across her forehead. So I asked someone who knew her, poor soul, what's the matter with her? Oh, it's nothing, I was told. She had surgery, a facelift, to get rid of her wrinkles. 
and I was under the impression that she was in an accident and had to have surgery. What has the world come to? Yaronda, today people do not consider that using makeup and cosmetics is a sin. Yes, I am aware of that. I ran into a soul once who used to have the face of an angel. She had so much makeup on that I did not recognize her. God made everything good, I told her, but he has made a mistake with you. Why, Father, she asked, here, right under your eyes, he did not put enough black ink. That's the mistake he made. He made everybody else good and beautiful, but in your case, he made a mistake. You poor soul, are you blind? Can't you see you are actually making yourself ugly? It's like taking a beautiful Byzantine icon and painting all over it, smudging and ruining it with your brush strokes. We want to paint over the image of God. It's like someone who knows nothing about painting, taking a great painter's masterwork and starting to paint over it, making it uglier with each additional brush stroke. This is like saying to God, my God, you did not do this right. Let me fix it. Another time a woman came to see me with nails long like a hawk's, painted bright red, and told me, I have a gravely ill child and I have been praying for his health, but nothing happens. Please pray for him, Father, because my prayers... What kind of prayer are you really offering, I answered. All you are doing is scratching Christ with these nails. If you want your child to get well, the first thing to do is to cut off your nails. The least you can do for his health is to cut them off and remove that polish. Do it as a sacrifice for his well-being. Should I then paint them white, Father, she insisted? What I am saying to you is to remove the polish and cut them off. Make this simple sacrifice for the health of your child. And you want to know if you can paint them white? Are you serious? If God wanted you to have red nails, he would have made them that way. Can I paint them white? She asked again. Oh, I've had it. The way you are going, both you and your child will do well. I thought to myself, it's the mother more than anyone else who can give her, ch her children a cold when she is not dressed with modesty. Some mothers will even exploit their children for their own welfare. A person may not be very good looking, or they may have some handicap. God knows that such flaws will help people spiritually because God is interested more in our soul than he is in our body. All of us have our qualities and shortcomings, small crosses to bear, nothing big, that help us save our soul. Part 4. The Church in Our Times The Church is the Church of Christ, and He is the one who governs her. The Church is not a temple built with stones, sand, and mortar by the faithful and destroyed by the fire of barbarians. The Church is Christ Himself. Chapter 1. Education. The Greek Language. Yet under why did they abolish the accent marks in the Greek grammar? Don't you see that letters are like people? Just as people these days are easily fed up with things and throw them away, so too letters are fed up with accents and circumflexes, and so we get rid of them. And since everybody is in a rush anyway, they don't even have the time to pause and put a period. You should see what some people are making out of our language. I was reading a modern Greek translation of the New Testament the other day. They were rendering... Out of Egypt have I called my son, Matthew 2.15, as from Egypt I have called my boy. But that doesn't sound right. This way you cannot tell the sacred from the profane. Supposedly they write this way so that there is uniformity in the written and spoken language. Can you think of anyone, even someone from the most remote village, who would not understand my son? Once... When I was at the Holy Mountain, I heard a reading that used colloquial Greek. The bread and wine, which take make up the Holy Communion. They used the, the, the common colloquial Greek for bread and wine. 
It just doesn't sound right. Is there anyone who does not know what the New Testament words bread and wine are mean? And will they benefit from a new translation? Yerunder, we've heard that they're thinking of replacing the Greek alphabet with Latin let characters. Forget it. This will never happen. Let's be grateful that God will always make good out of what is crooked and foul. Otherwise, we would not stand a chance. Don't worry. Our tradition and language were not lost back then when everything was recorded in manuscripts and there were no photocopy machines or other ways to preserve them. And you are afraid that they will be lost now? No. No matter what people do, they will not be lost. Have you noticed how Greek refugees from Russia have kept their customs? They could not have done it without Pontian Greek. This is how they kept the tradition in their heart for all those years. Even, even though they were given a little freedom, they chose to leave Russia to find freedom, for they felt like a bird taken out of the cage but confined in a room. They were probably suffocating in there. Can you imagine the poor people, how they must have felt? There are some people who are trying to create a new language, but Greek is not just a language. It's a tongue shaped by the fiery tongues of Holy Pentecost. It bears the flame of Pentecost. No other language can render adequately the dogma of our faith. This is why the good Lord even provided for the Old Testament to be translated into Greek by the, the 70, Septuagint and for the New Testament to be first written in Greek. Anyone seeking to study the Christian doctrines without the knowledge of ancient Greek is very likely to fall into serious error. And we have abolished the teaching of ancient Greek in our schools. Soon we'll have Germans teaching ancient Greek in our universities. That's what it will probably take for some people to realize the value of this language but I suppose someone will have to embarrass them first before they figure it out. And then you will hear them marvel, see how the church has been preserving ancient Greek all along? There are some who see an Orthodox nation and want to eliminate it. Do you know what this means? An Orthodox Christian nation today is a matter of great importance. In the old days, we had philosophy. It was with philosophy that St. Catherine silenced the philosophers of her time. The ancient philosophers paved the way for Christianity. The gospel was first written in Greek and spread throughout the world. The Greeks later enlightened the Slavs. There are some who see the very existence of Greece as an obstacle to their plans. She is causing us problems, they say. We must do away with her. Problems of the educational system. Yerunda, you often say that everything is falling apart. Does that include our system of education? Yes. Don't you see what's going on? Are these schools of ours for real? What kind of Greek are they teaching our children? What kind of history? Can you tell me what is going on in theology? An atheist has a university degree in theology, and they let him teach religion. But they don't bother to check. Is the man teaching religion or atheism? We cannot dismiss him, they say. Suppose that an English professor starts teaching mathematics. Will they allow that? I heard of a theologian who discourages people from receiving Holy Communion so they may not get AIDS. He must be one of those who got into the school of theology by accident because the computer gave him an admission score. This is not theology, the knowledge of God. In the old days, they used to say, the child has learned the sacred letters because education was then a sacred thing. Now you see a professor of theology who does not believe in God, who insults the prophets in front of the students, and yet he is not dismissed. Why is a person like that in the theology department to begin with? What sort of theologians will he graduate? The Protestants and the Catholics have exerted a great deal of influence. Catholicism is now full of the atheistic spirit. There are some among them who are trying to cut down the saints. St. Catherine, they claim, was not really that great. Her father was only a small and unimportant king. 
St. Nicholas was not that important either. St. George was really a myth. The Archangel Michael did not exist. He was a metaphor for the presence of God, and so was the Archangel Gabriel, and so on. Pretty soon they will be claiming that Christ is not God, he was only a great teacher. Then they will go even further and claim that God is only a force. In the end, they will claim that God is nature. There are those among our own people who will go for this nonsense, even though there is so much tangible evidence, so many prophets and prophecies, and so many living miracles. Someone came to me receive a blessing to go to Italy for liturgical studies and write a dissertation. Are you in your right mind? I asked him. You want to do your dissertation with the Jesuits, and you are coming to me to get a blessing? They don't have a clue about the subject. The teachers there are Jesuits, Uniates, and I don't know what else. You have to be very careful where you go to study. You see, what happens is that our young people, they go to England, to France, and other countries to study, and while there, they catch all kinds of viruses, and then they go on to do their dissertation. They study the Greek fathers in translations from our own language prepared by the foreigners, who either because they could not render the meanings correctly or by design, they added their own erroneous notions. Our own Orthodox scholars, who are learned in foreign languages, will catch this foreign virus, carry it to Greece, and spread it with their teaching. This is not to say that someone who is careful will not be able to separate the gold from the amber. Yet are the young people who are close to the church but have to go abroad to study because they are not accepted in our universities will often lose their faith and stray from the right path. I will suggest to people I know in education that they should establish a few more universities in Greece so that young people will not have to go abroad to study. This way, they will not go astray. They will stay and study here. Their parents will save money, and the country will stop losing all this currency. I always say to young people who are going abroad to study, go if you want to, but be careful not to lose your faith. Take only their practical knowledge and expertise. But above all, don't forget to come home to your homeland. Greece is waiting for you. You owe her your help. Stay close to the Greek people. Help all those poor souls who would otherwise have to go overseas to find a doctor or a specialist. Be careful not to let your heart grow cold. The Europeans are cold people. Even in the United States, one can become wealthy in material things, but experience a bankruptcy spiritually. And the strikes, Yeranda, they're so harmful. Students have been out of school for a month now and are roaming the streets. I tell teachers to strike only if someone wants to abolish, for example, the study of religion or prayer in school, or to remove the cross from the Greek flag and so forth. Then they must protest. But other than that, why should the poor children have to pay by missing so much school? In other words, Yananda, has our education system evolved in a way that will cause our youth great harm? It's true that many young people will be handicapped but the good Lord will judge accordingly. He will look into the situation and determine how these young people would have fared if they had not received all this influence and been harmed by it. But we have to do our part too. We must pray fervently so that God will help these poor children, keep them from harm's way, and grant them spiritual health and virtue. The Theory of Evolution the nonsense we hear in schools these days about Darwin's theory and the rest. Even the teachers themselves do not believe what they are teaching, but they go ahead because they want to pollute the minds of our youth and take them away from the church. This is what someone told me. Let's say that the soil contained various substances and microorganisms and God took these and created man. You mean, I replied, that if those elements did not exist in the soil, God would not have been able to create man? It would have been really difficult for him. Well, let's say he continued that he took some things from the monkey and perfected them. Couldn't that be how it happened? 
Are you trying to say, I answered, that God cannot create a perfect creature, that he cannot create a human being, even after dedicating a whole day to that? What should he have done? Go get spare parts? Why don't you read the prophecy of Job from the scriptures reading of Holy Thursday? Footnote, Job chapter 38, verse 14, quote, Or perhaps it was you who took dust from the earth, formed clay, made it into a living being with a mouth and the ability to speak, and placed him on earth. End of quote. Now, science does not accept all their own claims about our kinship with monkeys. How long has it been since man went to the moon? In all these years, have monkeys evolved enough to build a bicycle or at least a skateboard? Have you ever seen a monkey on a skateboard? Of course, you can teach him to do that, but that's not the same thing. But the man would not give up. He would insist, let's assume this or let's say that. Well, let's just say that... You will not say a thing, I finally told him. This way, you, you'll find the certainty you want. The theory of evolution was being taught by a professor I knew at the university. Once I said to him, In time and with proper care, a green bean plant will become a better green bean plant, the eggplant a better eggplant. If you feed and take care of a monkey, he will become a better monkey, but he will not turn into a human being. If a white man moves to a warm climate and is always in the sun, his complexion may change somewhat, but he will still be a white man. And then there's this to think about. Christ was born of a human being, the Panagia. Are we supposed to believe that his ancestors were monkeys? What blasphemy! And those who support this theory don't realize that they are blaspheming. They throw a stone and do not check to see how many heads they've cracked. All you will hear from them is, mine went farther than the other fellows. That's what they're all about these days. They marvel at who will throw a stone the farthest, but they care nothing about those who are passing by and the many heads their stones will crack. Yet under some people think that these theories will help bring Marxists to church. Well, Perhaps a few Marxists might come to church at first, but then they will want to organize as a party and start giving dictates to others. Now you must go to church. Now you may not. Now do this. Now do that. They will have rules for everything. In the end, they will start telling people, Who told you that there is a God? There's no God. The priests are making it all up to deceive you. This is what will happen. The Marxist will use the good-willing folks to achieve their goal. Marxists with a good will and disposition will come back to the church, repent, and go to confession. But those who have no good disposition, they will never change. They keep children away from the church. When I was a little boy, going to church helped me so much. We had a good grammar school teacher, and he helped us too. He would teach us patriotic songs and church hymns. On Sundays, we went to church and we chanted the doxology by the intercessions of the Theotokos, the Trisagion, Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal, and the Cherubic Hymn. Did little girls also join in the chanting? Yes, all the children would chant together. In the old days, the church was next to our school and we would run around and play in the churchyard. On holy days, the teachers would take us to church, even if we had to miss a class or two. He did not mind if we missed an hour of our class time to attend the divine liturgy. This way, children were taught holiness and were blessed and would turn into little lambs. One of our teachers was Jewish, but he did not teach us religion. A female teacher would come in and teach us that subject. But our Jewish teacher would still walk with us to church, even though that was not his faith. At church, we would sit upright and straight, and all of us would be quiet. I have noticed how wild and unruly children are today because they are kept away from the church. Take a child to church, and he will calm down and behave well, 
because he will have God's blessing and that will make him holy. They don't allow children to go to church because they don't want the spiritual influence. But they will not keep them away from all kinds of nonsense. No, they will even teach it to them. What they don't realize is that if children were to come under the influence of the church, the worst that could happen to them is that they will stop being mischievous. They will behave, be good students, and will not run around confused as they do now. Not only that, but as they grow older, they will have the right outlook on national issues. They will stay away from bad company and avoid drugs. This way their lives will not be wasted. Isn't this what they need to turn out to be good human beings? Can't they at least realize that and respect what the church can offer? But you see, the goal of some people is to keep children away from the church. They poison and pollute them with various theories and shatter their faith. They keep them away from what is good because they want to see them wasted. And they start from an early age. And then, as you might expect, instead of little lambs, they end up little kid goats. They strike back at their parents and teachers and at anyone who tries to discipline them. They turn everything upside down. They demonstrate, occupy buildings, refuse to attend class and anything else you can imagine. And then one day they really get out of hand. They get a hold of those in power and tear them to pieces. Only then perhaps will society wake up and come to its senses. The children are being burdened with too many things. You'd be surprised at the bad handwriting and grammatical mistakes I have seen among high school and even university graduates. Many of us only graduated elementary school, but we never made such mistakes. Students from the schools of philology and law fare better, but graduates of other schools don't even know how to write whereas graduates of junior high school back then were like university graduates, Yeranda? Exactly. If elementary school education was so much better, you can imagine how good junior high school was. Today they load students with all kinds of useless subjects and they end up confusing them. They burden them with mere information without a spiritual counterbalance to it. The first thing that children should learn at school is to have fear of God. You see these little kids so young and they start learning English, French, German, but no ancient Greek, no Byzantine music, you name it. When will they have the time to learn all these things? They teach them all kinds of letters and numbers, but not what they're supposed to learn about their homeland. That they don't learn. No patriotic songs, no anything. Try asking a child today, in what district is your village? What's the population there? He has no idea. Instead, he tells you, well, I'll go to the bus depot, get on the bus, and then that will take me there. Since the conductor knows, I'll tell him that I want to go to this village. I'll pay my fare, and he'll take me there. When we were in elementary school, we used to know the entire globe by heart. We had to know by heart all major cities and countries with a population of over 500,000 people. We also had to know the longest and widest rivers of the world, and then the second longest and widest, the tallest mountains, and so on. And of course, every possible detail about Greece. And it's not only the children that have this problem. I have met university students who do not know the population of the city in which they are studying. I asked one of them to tell me what the tallest mountain of Greece was, and he did not know. How about the biggest river? No clue. Did he know what the smallest river was? No. A university student who knew nothing about his country. Our, quote, friendly neighbors will show up one day and tell him, this is not your country. It is our country. And he will say, you are right. It is as you say. Do you see where we are headed? But ask them about soccer or television, and they know everything and everybody by heart. 
Now compare this with the children who have come to Greece from Albania and no Greek. You ask Greeks from northern Epirus, where did you learn how to read and write? And they answer, in prison. They turned prisons into schools while our children have turned schools into prisons, occupied them and locked themselves inside. Young people today, especially teenagers, are confused. It gets worse with junior high and high school. By the time they get to university, they are more mature. They only go to class whenever they like. The problem is that instead of taking the proper measures to improve education, they're making it worse. I can see how eager they are to undermine everything spiritual. Listen to this prayer taken from an elementary school reading anthology. Footnote, anthology reader for grammar school pupils. Quote, O oh my Panagia, yours is the most beautiful baby in the whole world. Now we are in trouble. Think of what children learned in school in the old days and what they're learning now. Listen to this. Quote, my bright and cunning little goat with crooked, twisted, shiny horns, gather your little devils here to make goat milk for your grandkids your little crazy devil kids to drink. Footnote from My Language for the second grade publisher of Grammar School Books, part three, page 11. Imagine small children trying to learn such things, such demonic things, but the reason behind it is to promote the devil so that Satanists can realize their schemes. May God come to our assistance. These days, they're not helping our children go through the good kind of change. Instead, they make it easier for them to come under demonic influence. And the education they get does not really teach them how to use their mind. And that's why you don't see sharp and quick minds. Inside a dull mind, you will find a brewing storm. All those who made inventions did so because they put their mind to work. If they ran into a problem, they would work their mind hard and find a solution. Today, people will consult manuals, notes. They will look for instructions, and that's all. Everything is numbered. This screw goes to number one, the other goes to number two. And if something goes wrong, and the equipment does not work, their solution is, let's call the mechanic. They don't think of filing down the hole to fit the screw, or covering the screw with a piece of plastic, to make it fit tightly into the hole, but right away they resolve, let's call the mechanic. What can I say? And on top of that, you have television and all the media making the problem worse by stupefying the audience. Even those who are smart end up sounding like tape recordings. What I am trying to stress is that we must put our mind to work. That's the most basic thing. For if the mind is not doing its job, it will figure out one thing and get lost over another. What matters most is that our mind is creative, that it gives birth to solutions. A sterile mind is an underdeveloped mind. Teaching is sacred work. Yeronda, sometimes the difficulties that educators encounter at school stem from their colleagues more than from anything else. Today, one needs a high degree of discernment and enlightenment to make the right decisions in dealing with one's colleagues. Every situation will need special prudence and divine illumination. Sometimes it may even be better not to make one's faith public. It is better to move quietly and let his sound orthodox life speak for him. This way, he will be able to help others rather than annoy them. In education particularly, there are certain issues that work like a tumor. Sometimes they are benign, other times they are malignant. If we take a position following one line of thinking, we may end up doing more harm than good. If we operate and the tumor is malignant, we may risk a medita metas metastasis. We must move with great caution. Isn't it true enough, Yaranda, that those educators who want to do their job right will have a very hard time because their hands are tied? If someone really wants to do his job right, he can find a way. People manage to do that under atheistic governments, and they cannot manage here in Greece? 
Once a Greek fellow went to Bulgaria, visited a school, and started giving away little crosses to the children. A Communist Party member was standing nearby and noticed him. As soon as the teacher realized what was going on, she went to the children and took the crosses from their hands, scolding them for having accepted them. But then, as soon as that atheist left, she gave the crosses back to the children. Do you see how the teacher was abiding by the law, but also by God? In Asia Minor, our teachers went through so many hardships. Those were difficult times. But they put their whole heart in their job. They cared deeply for their students. They were men and women of piety who made so many sacrifices. Think of the wisdom and prudence of St. Arsenios of Cappadocia when he lived in Farasa. He had prepared a classroom, but instead of desks, he had placed the fleece of goats and sheep on the floor. The children would sit or kneel on them while attending their lessons. He handled the problem with great wisdom, and this way he managed not to provoke the Turks, who would pass by and see them and think that they had gathered to pray. Often, St. Arsenios would take the children for short trips and would take them to one of his own fields that looked like a garden and instruct them, quote, If you see a Turk coming along, look busy. Pretend that you are cutting a branch or something so that he will think you are working on the garden. And that's what those poor children did. You see, had the Turks realized that he had taken them on a class trip, he would have been in trouble. That's how those secret schools were run. When the Turk was out of sight, the children would go back to their games. He would do the same in the summer. He would find ways to get them together so that he would help them go on with their lessons and not forget what they learned during the year. Yarendra, why did St. Arsenios write the lessons in Turkish using the Greek alphabet? So that the children would also learn Turkish and be able to get by in life. And if the Turks would catch him teaching a class and see the Greek letters, he would still be speaking Turkish, and so they would not be enraged. This way the children were taught both languages and the Turks were appeased. In this manner, the saint would impart to his students all his life experience, the precise spirit of an Orthodox life filled with piety and devotion. My point is that if we, we really want to instruct young people, we can do it under any circumstances. I ran across a beautiful book about Northern Epirus, written by a teacher. This is a brave woman, worth 500 men. It's amazing how she spoke to the tour guides. She was so eloquent that she had had them captivated. Bravo. A good teacher is so important, especially in our days. Children are like blank cassette tapes. One can put Byzantine music on them, or fill them with filthy songs. A teacher's work is sacred work. His responsibility is enormous, and if he is careful, God will pay him a great wage. Teachers should teach young people the fear of God. They should find a way to convey to them truths about God and about our country. Let them sow the seeds and not be disappointed if they don't see the fruit. Nothing is wasted. In God's good time, their effort will bear fruit. Teachers should always do their sacred work with goodness, leniency, and love for the children they teach, and try to awaken Philotimo in their hearts. Children need love. They need warmth. They may have neither a home, and they crave for them. If teachers come to love their students, they will be loved by them, and their work will be easier for it. Our teacher used to strike us with his rod occasionally, but he loved us and we loved him. He did not have children of his own, and he loved us so much. That's why I often say that it's a good thing for parents to have many children, but it's even better for teachers to teach the right things and help the children of others be born anew, becoming in this way the most blessed parents. Because when teachers do their sacred work, they give to society renewed human beings and help to make this world a better place. Chapter 2 The Clergy and the Church Yeranda, why haven't you become a priest? The point is to be saved. The priesthood is not a means to salvation. 
Did anyone ever suggest that you become a priest? Yes, they put pressure on me many times. When I was in a Cenobitic monastery, they pushed for me to become a priest and to take the great schema. But what I always wanted was to become a monk in my inner life. That's what interested me, nothing else. When I was young and lived as a layman, I had experienced divine things. And when I eventually entered a monastery, I thought, all I need is to live the monastic life. That's where all my efforts went. Taking the great schema or being ordained a priest did not really matter to me. Recently, I was visited by someone at my keli of Panahuda, and he insisted that I become a priest. He actually went to the ecumenical patriarchate for this purpose and met with the exarchy and when he returned to the holy mountain. But they told him, why don't you tell him yourself? If we make the decision for him, he may flee. So he came and told me, I was really upset when I heard what he had done, but then he went on. Why don't you at least become a priest so that you will be able to read the prayer of forgiveness since all those people who come to you do not only tell you their problems, but also confess their sins. After all, weren't you telling me yourself about the confusion that is created because people will sometimes say different things, things differently or will confess only half of what you instructed them to confess? to their spiritual fathers or, or to bishops. Become a priest. This way you'll be able to hear their confessions, read the prayer of forgiveness, inform them of the remission of their sins, having their lives restored in good spiritual state. The poor fellow said these things to me with every good intention, but this was not for me. Yeronda, what must one do when others pressure him to become a priest, but he feels that he is not up to it? He should speak his mind. No one can be forced to accept the priesthood or the great schema. But if he accepts it out of obedience and with humility and adds a bit of philotimo and a little love, then God will take care of the rest, and he will fulfill whatever is lacking. Keep in mind that people can discern whether a man became a priest out of love and a desire to serve his church. They have this criterion that never errs. There are those who want the priesthood in order to glorify themselves. They will be overcome with difficulties because Christ will not help them unless they first humble themselves and repent. But those who sought the priesthood for spiritual reasons will have Christ on their side in difficult times. It's far better if a man is pressured by others to become a priest, if it is the church that wants him there and the people, because then he will have the protection of Christ and when difficulties come, he will have both the people and Christ on his side. Those in the clergy who planned all along to become priests and did, did so according to their plan are few and far between. I don't take them into account. Most priests have the right intention in the beginning, but then the devil gets involved, vainglory and an obsession with high office take charge of the person. And whatever good intentions he might have had are soon forgotten. We have now reached the point where some priests who want to lead a parish or become bishops and so on will go as far as asking their connections to intervene on their behalf. You see, when they, they started, they were running for Christ. Now they're running for the gold. They crave for golden crosses, golden mitres, diamonds, and anything you can imagine except the essentials. It is so easy for the devil to deceive us when we are not watchful. Yet under what does God want from a priest? What should people expect from him? What God wants from him is too profound to touch on right now. Now let's talk about what people want and expect from a priest. In the old days, the priests lived an ascetic life. They were virtuous and holy, and naturally, people felt a reverence for them. Today, people want two things from the priest, to be disinter disinterested in money and to have love. When they find a priest who has both, they consider him a saint, and then they will run to church. By finding their way to the church, they also find their salvation. Then God will condescend, and the priest will also be saved. 
it is so important for the priest to be a man of great purity. The devil goes after the monk and tries to weaken his spirit with all kinds of petty schemes. His purpose is to render him useless and deprive his prayer of spiritual power. If the monk wishes to have the grace of the Holy Spirit, he must be a true monk. He will then have spiritual authority and can help others very positively with their prayer. By contrast, a priest may not be spiritually sound, but he will be helping in celebrating the holy mysteries of the church and giving blessings to people by the authority granted to him through ordination. In fact, even if a priest has killed someone, the mysteries he performs will still be effective until he is defrocked. But if a priest has a sound spiritual state, then he is a true priest and able to help people more. When priests and those who have pastoral duties ask me how they can help their parishioners, the thing I stress the most is this. They should labor spiritually in order to cleanse themselves by performing their spiritual duties and by going beyond duty so that they build a spiritual reserve for times of need. Spiritual work on ourselves is actually a silent work on our fellow human beings. It is work that instructs by example and causes others to imitate the good behavior they see in us and correct their own faults. If we want to work for the good of others but have not accumulated enough spiritual wealth to live on the spiritual interest that we make, while we work without pay for them, we will end up the most miserable and pitiful of people. For this reason, whatever work we do on our spiritual life should not be considered a waste of time. We may need to work for a short while or for a long time, even for a lifetime, but the important thing is to work because this mystical labor will preach the word of God mystically into the souls of people. Those filled with the grace of God will transmit divine grace and change those who live carnal lives. He liberates them from the tyranny of the passions, and in so doing, he brings them closer to God, where they find salvation. The priest will be held responsible. A priest can never shut his door to people. His is a grave responsibility. Some are desperate, others sick, and in need, some are dying. He must accept everybody, go wherever he is needed. A priest cannot deny his help. Souls are in danger, and he must be there to help them. For if he leaves them helpless and God takes them unprepared, will he not be held responsible? A monk, like me, can sh shut his door, leave for the desert, and disappear somewhere, and help people from there with his prayers. You see, my job is not to solve the problems that people bring to me, but to pray for their salvation. That's why I did not become a priest or a spiritual father. I wanted to help people in a different way. If I lived in the world as a priest, my door would always be open. I would have to respond to every need at all times, help everybody equally, no matter what their situation. I would first need to take care of my parishioners and devote whatever time was left to other people who sought my help. I would be interested not just in the faithful, but also in those who had no faith, the atheists and even the enemies of the church. Or if I was a spiritual father and someone accused another person to me, I would have to get the two of them together to try and figure out what's going on. I would pick up the phone to find out how someone else was doing, who had a temptation or faced a certain problem, and so on. How would I ever have peace of mind? A priest must lead the way, and the faithful will follow. In a flock, the ram will always lead the way, and the sheep will follow. When its horns are turned right, the entire flock goes in that direction. Sheep follow the ram, their leader. You will not see them apart, but always one following closely behind the other. The ram gives the direction and they follow. Yet under when a priest, an abbot, or anybody with pastoral duties happens to love a good and kind soul more than one that is always difficult and demanding, is that acceptable? Well, say, for example, that you are a shepherd and you have a large flock. Some of your lambs are grazing cheerfully and bleeding away, while others are sickly or have a leech on them and move away to the edge of the field. Which ones would you care take care of more? 
Wouldn't you take care of the sickly ones? Or suppose that a jackal attacks them and they start crying. Aren't you going to leave the ones that are quietly grazing and bleeding and rush to those that are being attacked and are wailing? A shepherd will care more for the sick or injured lamb and will look after it until it recovers. We must do the same. Whether they are performing miracles or have been wounded by our enemy, the devil, we must have them all in our heart, in the very same place. We should not have scorn in our hearts for wounded souls. In my life, I have felt much more love and pain and have been more concerned for those who have had a difficult life and struggled to overcome their passions than for those who are not tormented by passions. When love for the other person is deeply rooted in our heart, they can sense it. They are informed because love and divine grace bring sweetness and radiant beauty to our demeanor, which are impossible to hide. Pastors, whether they're bishops or priests, would do well to think of Moses and the troubles he went through caring for the great multitude of his complaining people. Imagine how much he must have prayed for them out of love and what he himself suffered wandering for years in the desert, waiting for God to lead them to the promised land. All they need to do is think of Moses, and this will give them loads of courage to suffer through their troubles without complaint, thinking all along that they pale in comparison to the troubles that Moses faced. The Secularization of the Clergy Yarunda, during the summer months when it's so hot, is it still necessary for the ecclesiasticos, footnote, the monk or nun who is in charge of church maintenance and who assists during the divine services? Is it still necessary for the ecclesiasticos to serve in church wearing the mantle? I find it so difficult. Oh, monastic life these days, what can I say? St. Athanasios would wear a thick garment and a very heavy cross as part of his ascetic discipline, and look at us today. When I was in Australia, I even saw a sacristan in shorts. This is perfect for the beach, I told him. It makes my job more comfortable wearing shorts, he replied. People start thinking this way and end up saying, let's get rid of our black rasos. They're so hot in the sun. Is the mantle in your way? Throw it away. Is your headscarf a nuisance because it makes you sweat? Throw it away. That is where we are headed. Now let's get serious. If you get hot, wear lighter clothing underneath. We can all manage to do that. Yananda, should someone take off the cassock, the raso, and wear only the mantle? And the priest should remove their under cassock and wear only their pants well what can i say the mantle is the proper garment of the monk it is granted to all those who wear the cross and bear the great schema during the tonsuring of a new monk the mantle is worn by the sponsoring senior monk who after vesting the new monk with the cassock removes his mantle and places it upon him i was really impressed by the fact that some women in alexandria egypt where it gets very hot, would still keep their tradition and be dressed in black. And here we are, having such a hard time bearing the cassock, which has been bequeathed to us by our fathers. Yet on the people often will remark, but is it really the cassock that makes one a priest? Well, for example, take a look at two olive trees, one with leaves, the other without. Which one of the two do you prefer? The one with leaves or the one without leaves? Once, when I was at the, the cell of the Holy Cross, I peeled the trunk of an olive tree and wrote this on it. The trees have shed their garments. Now we'll see their progress. Next to that, I wrote, A priest without his cassock is without his virtue, too. At that time, the raso the cassock issue was being discussed in many circles and some priests would come to get me, come to me to get a blessing to remove them. Yet under someone brought to the monastery an Orthodox priest who was not wearing his raso's cassock. Should we have asked for his blessing? What kind of blessing would you get from him? You should have told the person who brought him no matter how important he was. Forgive us, but it is our monastery's rule that priests wear a cassock. 
it is not appropriate for a priest to come to an Orthodox women's monastery and wear only his pants. You see, it's simple. When the person who brought him has no shame, and when the priest himself is not ashamed for having come without his cassock, why should you be embarrassed to ask him to put one on? I met a young Archimandrite once at an airport. He was wearing layman's clothes. He was going abroad and introduced himself. I am father so-and-so, he said. Where's your raso? I replied. Of course, I did not do a prostration. Yarunda, some people claim that it will be good for the clergy to modernize. When Patriarch Demetrios visited the Seminary of the Holy Cross in the United States, a few pious American students went up to him and said, Your Holiness, don't you think it's time for our clergy to be more up-to-date? The Patriarch's response was, St. Cosma said that when clergy turn into laymen, laymen will turn into demons. He gave them a good answer, didn't he? When the patriarch saw the luxurious hotel suite he was to stay in, he remarked, Is this where I am staying? It is better to get me a simple cot. When the clergyman is secularized, he becomes a candidate to evil. Yeranda, should we make sacred vestments a little simpler? Are ornate and embroidered vestments harmful to priests? The honorable thing for you to say in such circumstances is, we usually make this type of simple vestments. We could do more embroidery, but we avoid it because we are troubled by the thought that people will see them and be scandalized. People who have no faith will take advantage of this. For instance, we hear some people say, we have no bread to eat and the priests have all those sets of vestments. Serious priests will be interested in simple vestments and they will appreciate your work priests with a secular mentality will become embarrassed. But then you too will become embarrassed if you make the embroidery very ornate. You should use more embroidery only for the covers of the holy altar and of the holy gifts. But you should avoid placing crosses too low on the Stikaria and the Philonia. Place some other symbol there. Priests should, should not have to sit on the faces of the saints on the crosses. This would be irreverence. Which of you convicts me of a scandal? Yaranda, is divine grace lost from a priest who has committed a mortal sin? No, how can it be lost? Divine grace may depart from a priest, but it cannot be lost. If a priest is suspended from his duties, he retains the priesthood, but the mysteries are no longer activated through him. He has lost his power and authority. The main thing is grace. If grace is reinstated, then the mysteries will be valid. Much discretion is required when priests have impediments. Careful attention must be given to avoid public scandal through indiscriminate and sudden severe measures, which may also bring turmoil to the family of the priest. If he must cease celebrating the divine liturgy, the suspension should take place discreetly to avoid causing more harm than good to the faithful. The obstacles he might have are known to him and to God. But if he is suspended immediately, the faithful and his family will start wondering why and the damage will be greater. I know that sometimes God will allow even pious clerics to suffer various ailments, a bleeding nose, stomach ache, and so on, which will prevent them from celebrating the liturgy. Something similar could happen to priests who are facing a problem and allow them to cease serving the liturgy without embarrassment. Occasionally a priest in this situation will come to see me at my cell and it's clear to me that the poor soul must cease serving. Sometimes, however, his bishop may have a different opinion. In which case, what can I say? We can only pray for God's intervention. I remember once I had talked to a priest and prepared him for ceasing service, but then when he informed his spiritual father, and his bishop, they disagreed. So he remained an active priest despite the problem he was facing. Some time later, he was struck by a car. The priest was walking on the pavement when a car got off the street, ran over him, and left him dead on the spot. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hebrews 10.31 
Our Orthodox Church is not in any way defective. Whatever defects there might be are caused by us when we misrepresent the Church. And this can happen at all levels, from the highest levels of the hierarchy to that of the simple layman. The chosen may be few, but this is not a reason for concern. The Church is the Church of Christ, and He is the one who governs her. The Church is not a temple built with stones, sand, and mortar by the faithful, and destroyed by the fire of barbarians. The Church is Christ Himself, and he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Matthew 21, verse 44. Christ is tolerating the present state of things. Divine grace is merciful and remains active for the sake of our people. We are going through a storm, but the sun will come out again. Things will begin to clear up. This situation will not last forever. It is written in the gospel, a bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. Isaiah 42, verse 3, and Matthew 12, verse 20, to continue. Christ said this so that we have no excuse on the day of judgment. You see, when the oil lamp is running out of oil, and there's only a little oil left in the wick, it may flicker for a while, but it will not last long. In the end, it will go off. It is like a dying person's last glimmer. But Christ does not want to blow at it and put it out because then it might say, had you not blown at me, I would still be burning. This way Christ will say, I did not put you out. Your cup ran out of oil. He will not touch a cracked reed either because if it breaks, it will protest, you touched me and I broke to pieces, to which his answer would be, but you were cracked and would break anyway. Why do you blame me? When we, monks and clergy, do not live according to the gospel, we end up spreading atheism. The world is in need of our virtues, not of our vices. The example set by monks makes such a big difference in the lives of lay people. They will look for all kinds of excuses to justify their sins, and that's why we must be very careful. You see, we cannot say after Christ, which of you convicts me of sin? John 8:46 But what we can say is which of you convicts me of scandal What Christ said he said because he is perfect God and perfect man we are all human We have all kinds of flaws all kinds of downfalls you name it but we should not cause scandal to others I remember what a general told me once If I had not received the faith from my mother I would have lost it when I went to Cyprus during the hostilities. There was a man, a member of the church, who was yelling on the phone, slaughter the Turks, with no apparent reason, when in fact the opposite order had been issued. Do not harm the Turks. Take another example. Many of the refugees who came to Greece from Farasa and Asia Minor ended up being misled by certain heresies that had appeared at that time because they would see so many priests and bishops who had no piety whatsoever. They were scandalized because the people they saw going to church did not live a spiritual life. Back in Farasa, things were very different, and therefore when the evangelicals st showed up claiming, we live according to the gospel, the poor refugees were misled. But if a bishop, a priest, or a monk is at fault, it is not Christ who should be blamed. And yet that's what people do. Isn't he representative of Christ, they ask? Yes, but is Christ pleased with this man? Do they even consider what awaits these representatives in the next life? You see, those who are scandalized by problems in the church and end up losing their faith don't realize that blaming the church for the mistakes of one priest is like blaming the state for the mistakes of one policeman. Those among them who have a good disposition will appreciate this point when it's explained to them. Many form opinions out of ignorance because no one has helped them understand the issue. And in this sense, you could say that their reaction is justified. Yerunda, 
How come no one has come forward to denounce all these church scandals? It is not possible to come forward on all ecclesiastical matters. There are situations that make this very difficult. It's even possible that one will patiently tolerate a situation until God shows him the right course of action. Tolerating a situation that is not right and accepting it for what it is are two very different things. When we run into such problems, it's important that we have the guts to speak the truth and do so respectfully instead of issuing insults and going public with our disdain. It's best that we talk privately to the person at fault with love and compassion and draw his attention to certain things. One is not sincere and straightforward who speaks the truth in your face and makes it public, but one who has love and a truly authentic life and who speaks discreetly when necessary and says what must be said at the right time. Those who will reprimand indiscreetly suffer from spiritual confusion and malice. They see others as mere blocks of wood, and while they strike at them without mercy, they themselves feel pleased to have beaten their opponents into a, quote, cubic square. Only in a person under the influence of a leading demon, it is justifiable to ridicule people publicly, to reveal their past, only those, of course, upon whom the devil has rights, in order to unsettle weak souls. It's natural for the unclean spirit to reveal the vices of people. It never exposes their virtues. But those who have overcome their passions and have no malice left in them will correct evil with goodness. If they see a filthy spot that is difficult to remove, they will go and put a cover on it, so that those who see it may not be repulsed. By contrast, those who spend their time sorting out garbage resemble chickens. Nowadays, this was said in 1974, the devil is putting smudges on everything he can find and spreads confusion everywhere. But in the end, he will fall on his face. In due time, the righteous will shine for all to see. It will be dark, so dark that even if they have a little bit of virtue, they will stand out and people will see the light and turn to them for help. Those who today are causing all these scandals will feel great shame when this comes to pass, if they're still around. Confronting Ecclesiastical Issues Yet in the, what is the right way to confront difficult ecclesiastical issues? We must avoid extremes. Extreme solutions will never solve a problem. In the old days, the grocer would add little by little with the scoop on the scale to find the exact amount and get the right balance. He would avoid adding or removing something abruptly. Extreme views, no matter on what side, are always a source of trouble for Mother Church, but also for those who hold them, because in the end, both will suffer. It's like having a possessed person, full of spiritual insolence, contempt for everything, pulling on one end, and a narrow-minded fool, zealous in his ignorance, pulling on the other. This is a confrontation, in other words, between a foolish zealot and a man steeped in spiritual arrogance. And the two bicker and strike at each other because what is missing from both is divine grace. And the worst that could happen, God forbid, is that there will be no end to their bickering. One end will keep on striking at the other, with no end in sight. But those who will take these extremes in order to bend them and bring them together in harmony will be crowned by Jesus Christ with two unfading crowns. We must be careful not to create problems in the church or magnify the small indiscretions that take place here and there because this will only make things worse and give pleasure to the devil. The person who gets overly upset and angry at the sight of a minor mistake and rushes head-on supposedly to put things in order, resembles the foolish sacristan who sees a candle dripping and rushes head-on to put it out, knocking over people, and candle stands in his way, causing an even greater disorder during worship. Unfortunately, we have so many people keen on disturbing Mother Church these days. 
The educated among them have only an intellectual grasp of the dogmas. They don't approach them in the spirit of our Holy Fathers. And the un un uneducated are not far behind. They have grasped the dogmas with their teeth only, and that's why they cannot discuss ecclesiastical matters without grinding their teeth at each other. As a result, they cause greater harm to the church than the enemies of our orthodox faith. A torrential river is not good because it will sweep away logs, rocks, even people. But a shallow river is not good either because it will become a breeding ground for mosquitoes. Then there are those who spend their time criticizing each other instead of working for the common good. Instead of keeping an eye on themselves and their behavior, they watch for mistakes in others. They are on the lookout for what others will say or write, and they are ready to strike at them without mercy. Of course, they could be writing or saying the exact same thing themselves and supporting it with all kinds of references to sacred scripture and the Holy Fathers. These people cause great harm because on the one hand, they do injustice to their brothers and sisters, while on the other, they undermine them before the faithful. And these actions also end up scandalizing and sowing unbelief in weak souls, those who may justify their malice by claiming their right to correct others instead of concentrating on their own faults, or those who go public with church problems even matters too sensitive to discuss. On the principle of tell it to the church, Matthew eighteen seventeen, should do two things. First, they should examine their own little church, their families, or their brotherhood, and only if these pass the test, if they prove good, they should go ahead and embarrass mother church. Good children, I believe, will never bring charges against their mother. Everyone is useful in the church. Every person has something to offer. There's plenty of room for everybody, for those who have a mild character and for those who may be strict and demanding. The body of the church resembles the human body. Just as we need both sweet and sour foods, even bitter herbs, because each food has something to contribute in substance and vitamins, so too the body of the church needs every one of us. Each person complements the character of the other, and we are all obliged to tolerate not only the spiritual temperament of others, but also their human weaknesses. Now, unfortunately, there are those who have irrational expectations from other people. They expect everyone to be like them, to have their spiritual temperament. And if the other person does not meet their standard, if they are a bit more lenient or a bit more austere, they're eager to find them non-spiritual. High office and vainglory. I wonder how some people can attach so much importance to human glory and ignore the glory of God which awaits them when we shall depart from the glory of men. What will it really benefit us if we gain the highest office and the admiration of everybody? Where will this admiration lead us? heaven or hell? Where will this admiration lead us? Remember what Christ said, I do not receive glory from men, John 5.41. What would it benefit me, a monk, to become a priest monk, a bishop, or a patriarch? Would these offices help me save my soul, or would they become a burden on my weak shoulders and send me crashing into hell? If there were no next life, Perhaps we could find a way to justify such nonsense. But he who is seeking the salvation of his soul will not seek high office. He counts all things as refuse in order to gain Christ. Philippians 3.8 Moses was sent by God to free the people of Israel, but he never made it to the promised land because he was so frustrated with his people that he became indignant with God. For years, he was facing their complaints, and then one day, he could not take it anymore. They are asking for water. He said, where am I supposed to find water for them? Numbers chapter 20, verse 10 and following. What do you mean, where? Only a few days ago, you struck at the rock and water gushed out and you gave them to drink. Was that so hard to do? 
but he was so tangled up in the concerns of his people that he forgot how much water was provided earlier. And with all these things on his mind, he did not realize his mistake so as to seek forgiveness from God. That's all he had to do, and God would have forgiven him. But he did not, and God's answer, the rule he gave to Moses, was a reprimand for his indignation. Moses, of course, was received by God into paradise, and God honored him when he sent him together with the prophet Elijah to Mount Tabor at the Lord's transfiguration. This should help us understand that high office and its responsibilities is a great obstacle in the Christian's journey toward paradise. Some people, for whom God has provided no responsibilities whatsoever, will nonetheless, nevertheless seek duties and high office. And when they don't get them, they become irate and end up wearing out their soul. God's very temple, as we read in St. Paul's epistle to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 3.16. And while Jesus Christ is preparing them for a heavenly glory, they try to enter paradise through vainglory, the glory of this world. Perhaps some of you might object. Why is it that some people who are glorified in the world are also glorified by God? Well, if you want to know the truth, those who seek human glory will never be glorified by God. We should never seek responsibilities on our own. Rather, we should rejoice when re re relieved from them and worried when they become too many. If we don't react this way, it means that somewhere inside, pride is working secretly to undermine us. We should never pursue high office for the sake of glory because this is a symptom of a really sick soul. It shows that we are marching on a sick path, a path other than that of humility that brought the Holy Fathers to paradise. So many of our Holy Fathers have avoided the responsibilities of high office. They did not wish to become an abbot, a priest, a hierarch. Some would even go so far as mutilating a hand, or mutilating a nose or an ear or a tongue, and in this way be disqualified for ordination. Others had to be ordained from above their cell after the roof was removed, while there were those like St. Amphilochius who were ordained from a distance. It's not that these men lacked an, an education or holiness. They had both. But they had realized how important the soul is and how the responsibilities of office become a burden and an obstacle in the salvation of the soul. For this reason, they avoided high office, and so they set themselves on the right path. Even on the holy mountain, there are those who consider priesthood as an obstacle to the spiritual life, because in addition to the many responsibilities they typically have, they are also obliged to accompany a bishop when he pays a visit or attend various feasts and celebrations, which may be spiritual in nature, but still do not bring peace to the monastic soul. When I was at the Cenobium, I met a deacon who had grown old and died a deacon. When he was still a young monk, the monastery needed a deacon, and so they went ahead and ordained him. Later, younger monks arrived. While they became deacons and priests, he remained a deacon, giving his turn to everybody else. When they urged him to become a priest, he would say, The monastery does not need another priest. We have our younger brothers for that, thank God. Later, he was assigned to the office. But then, when educated monks joined the monastery, he asked to be relieved of his duties. When the monastery was going through rough times, this devout deacon pleaded with a virtuous priest to accept the position of abbot. The priest responded, Here you are, avoiding any kind of responsibility and putting the full load on me. When you become the supervisor, I will become the abbot. And that's actually what happened. When the troubles were over and the monastery prospered, he once again gave his resignation. This deacon was such a great help to me. He was full of God's grace. The holy community of the holy mountain would always go to him when there were difficult matters to resolve. They wanted his enlightened opinion. Yananda, what drives spiritual people who have no interest whatsoever in money to go after glory? Were the ancient Greeks right in saying that, quote, money has been despised by many, glory by no one? A saying 
of a tyrant of the ancient city of Lindos Rhodes and one of the seven sages of antiquity since 6th century BC. To continue, it's their empty head that drives them. It's all about vainglory. The saying, money has been despised by many, reflects the attitude of people who live in the world. Ancient Greeks thought this way because they did not know the true God. There's no room in the spiritual life for vainglory. Has anyone been denigrated more than Christ was? The fathers would seek dishonor, and God would instead honor them. Those who crave for glory are still living in the world. They're playing soccer and cheering the home team. When we read about glory in the gospel, it's a glory that is full of love and humility. Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, that the Son may glorify thee, and this is life eternal, that they know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. John 17, 1-3. What Christ was asking of God was to allow people to know their Savior and be saved. But today, what they care about the most is finding glory wherever they can. They look for glory here, and they look for glory there, and in the end it's folly they find. Folly here, folly there. This is what Christ meant when he said, How can you believe who receive glory from one another and seek not the glory that comes from the only God? John chapter 5, verse 44. And St. Paul says, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. 2 Timothy 3.13 These things make my stomach turn. I could not survive in such an environment, even for 24 hours. Responsibilities can be a great obstacle to the spiritual life. Those who are engaged in spiritual warfare will stay away from them. People who pursue high office and supervising posts do not end, end well. Egoism and personal issues get in the way. Supervisors clash and fight with each other because all they can think about is their own selves. But those who work with Philotimo and remove the self from their work and avoid making themselves comfortable at all times, these people will be able to help others. For it is only when the self is not involved that needy souls will find rest in the help they receive. And those who help them will find inner peace both in this life and in the life to come. In the old days, the Holy Fathers would depart for the desert where they would struggle to be emptied of all their passions. Without any plans or designs of their own, they would put their life in God's hands and avoid high office and authority, even when they reached holiness. Only when the Mother Church needed them, they would obey God's will and accept offices, glorifying the name of God with their holy lives. These men became spiritual blood donors, having achieved a high level of spiritual health in the desert, on a good spiritual diet and under the direct supervision of the fathers, they would then give their blood to those in need. The Administration of the Church The Orthodox Church was always administered by synods. According to the Orthodox spirit, the Church is administered by synods, and the monasteries by the assembly of elders. Decisions are reached jointly by the archbishop and the synod, and by the abbot or abbess, and the assembly of senior monastics. The archbishop is first among equals, and the patriarch is not a pope. He and the other hierarchs have the same rank. While the pope's rank is different, he sits up high and others kiss his feet. The patriarch sits together with all the other hierarchs, and his work is to coordinate. This is also the relationship between an abbot or abbess and the members of the assembly of elders. They are first among equals. An archbishop or an abbot cannot do anything they want. God will enlighten the mind of a hierarch on one issue and the mind of an elder on another. It works like it did with the four evangelists who complemented each other. Here too, each person will state his opinion, and if someone disagrees, his dissent will be recorded in the minutes especially in cases where a decision is contrary to the commandments of the gospel. Those who disagree should have their dissent recorded, for otherwise it will appear as if the dissension to the decision was unanimous. 
if this person signs the document without recording his objection, he has actually caused harm and stands to blame. But if he makes his opinion public, even if the majority disagrees, he will be in good standing with God. When the synod and the assembly of elders do not function well, the orthodox spirit gives way and the papist spirit takes over. It's in the nature of the orthodox spirit that each and every person has the right to speak his mind. No one should refrain from speaking out of fear or in order to flatter or superior or because they want to be in good terms with the archbishop or the abbot. When clergymen enter church administration at a young age, even when qualified, they stand to be harmed and to waste their time. They will get caught up in the wheels of administration, of clerical work, and so on, and will receive little spiritual assistance even though they have great potential. Especially in some cases, it is sad to see that if these men had worked on their spiritual life, they would one day become great assets for the mother church. When we are not concerned about our spiritual state in the good sense of concern, we resemble merchants who buy and sell without keeping an account of how much they owe until one day they end up bankrupt and in jail. I get really sad when I hear of young priests working in an office. If they were kept out of administration a while longer, they would be helped a lot later in life. But unfortunately, this happens quite frequently. Instead of older, experienced priests who would be able to work spiritually with their flock, they appoint inexperienced young priests and the damage is double. What I am trying to say is that young men take on responsibilities without adequate spiritual preparation and find themselves with little spiritual wealth and very demanding posts. On the other hand, older priests are not given any responsibilities and as a result have no opportunity to share their valuable experience and the enlightenment they have received from God. The Divine Liturgy Yet under when the Divine Liturgy is celebrated, should there always be someone who will receive Holy Communion? Yes, because that's the purpose of the Divine Liturgy, even if few are ready. All the prayers refer to the faithful who will be receiving Communion. For this reason, there must be at least one person present and able to receive communion. Of course, once in a while, there may be no one ready to receive communion. But that's not really the issue. At least someone, even a small child, a baby, should receive communion. And when there is no one to receive Holy Communion, then the liturgy is celebrated for the priest himself to receive communion and to commemorate the names of the living and the departed. And of course, this should be the exception and not the rule. We get to live through the events of the New Testament at every divine liturgy. The holy prothesis is Bethlehem. The holy altar is the holy sepulcher. And the crucifix is the holy Golgotha. All of creation is sanctified by the divine liturgy through the presence of Christ. The divine liturgy sustains the world. What God has given us is so awesome, and we are unworthy of it. There are priests who live this awesome mystery at every divine liturgy. A priest once told me something that a very simple and good priest had once confessed to him. Quote, I have such a hard time during the catalysis, the consumption of the holy gifts at the end of the divine liturgy. My filthy tears fall into the chalice. I can't contain them, and this makes me so upset. And as he was speaking these words, he was crying. So the other priest told him, Please, Father, ask Christ to give some of those filthy tears to me too. Yananda, why do you step down from the stasidi when the priest says the prayers of preparation before the iconostasis prior to entering the altar to put on his holy vestments? I step down because as the priest is praying, God is sending him divine grace to rid him of his weaknesses and allow him to celebrate the divine liturgy. At this time, the faithful should also be praying with reverence so that they may receive grace. The divine liturgy begins with the proskimidi, the service of preparation of the holy gifts. It's amazing how God will sometimes allow us to understand and experience the holy mysteries. When I was the ecclesiastical, something happened to me. 
once as the priest was cutting the prosphora, the offering bread, and saying the words, As a sheep he was led to the slaughter. I heard the quivering of a lamb on the holy discarin. And again, when he said, Sacrificed is the lamb and son of God who takes away the sin of the world. I heard the bleeding of a lamb coming from the holy prothesis. How awesome! This is why I tell priests not to prepare the proskumidi by cutting the prosphoron ahead of time and then simply placing the amnos, the lamb, upon the discarion. Rather, they should be making the actual incisions on the prosphoron as they're saying the words, as a sheep he was led to the slaughter. They should take the lance and sacrifice the lamb as they are saying the appropriate words, sacrificed is the lamb of God. When the priest rings the little bell at the time of the proskimidi, and while you are silently commemorating the names of people, your heart should participate in the pain of every soul you mention, living or departed. You should bring to mind the general problems faced by people, and then more specifically those persons that you have in mind, saying something like, For Maria, for Nicholas, you, Lord, know their problems. Please help them. The names people give you should be commemorated during several divine liturgies, some in three, some in five, and then more. Why should some names be commemorated at all times and others who may be in more need not commemorated at all? That's difficult for me to understand. Although names of non-Orthodox Christians should not be commemorated at the prothesis and placed on the discarion, we can still pray for their health and enlightenment and even say a supplicatory service for them. Yaronda, some priests say that they do not want to celebrate the Divine Liturgy very often. They don't want to turn it into a routine. That's not right. A priest should not be making such statements. It's like saying, I don't visit my relatives often because I want them to miss me and give me a warmer welcome when I visit. However, appropriate preparation is needed before celebrating the Divine Liturgy. Holy Communion will cure and sanctify the person who struggles spiritually. But how can it possibly help those who do not make the effort? What will be there for Christ to transform if we do nothing? Once in the cave of St. Athanasius, there lived an elder with two monks under his guidance. One was a hero monk, priest monk, the other deacon monk. So one day the two monks went to a chapel to celebrate the Divine Liturgy. The priest was envious of the deacon and despised him because he was smarter and more capable than him in every respect. But the deacon also did not help the situation with his rather arrogant manner. The priest was prepared. He had done all the necessary things. He had read the preparatory prayers for Holy Communion and so on. But unfortunately, he had left out the most important preparation, the one that happens internally. He had not confessed his faults with humility in order to dispel any malice and envy that he harbored in his heart. Things that will not just go away simply by changing our clothes and washing our face. And so, being only externally prepared, he approached the awesome and holy altar to celebrate the liturgy. And then, as soon as he started the proskomidi, guess what happened? All of a sudden, a loud noise was heard, and he saw the holy discarion move away from the prothesis and disappear. Of course, they were not able to celebrate the liturgy. My mind tells me that something terrible would have happened to those two monks if God had not intervened in this manner to prevent them from celebrating the liturgy, being as they were in such a spiritual state. Yeah, no, if something happens during the divine liturgy, can it be interrupted? No, no. It cannot. When the Divine Liturgy is in progress, the priest cannot interrupt it, no matter what happens. Even if war is declared, he must go on until it is over. Even if the enemy is surrounding the church, the most he can do is hurry up and finish. With God's help, he'll be able to do that, but he must trust in God and not be afraid. Priests who celebrate the mysteries of the Lord should be most watchful, pure, and exacting. For priests are more exalted than the angels. 
The holy angels will cover their face during the mystery of the Holy Eucharist, while the priest with his face uncovered will be celebrating it. Part 4 continued, Chapter 3, Feasts and Holidays. Let us, the faithful, celebrate a spiritual feast. Our Lord Jesus Christ, with his great love and joy, which fill the souls of the faithful during his holy feast days, exalts us spiritually and truly resurrects us. All we need to do is participate in these feasts and celebrate them with a spiritual appetite. For once we taste the heavenly wine to which the saints will treat us, we will become drunk in spirit. Yet under what must we do to live a spiritual life during the feasts? To live through Christ's feasts in a spiritual way, we must keep our minds focused on the holy days themselves and not on the work that we have to do to prepare for them. We should think about the events of each holy day, Christmas, Theophany, Pascha, and so on, and say the Jesus prayer, glorifying God in our heart. This way we will celebrate with reverence every feast day of the church. For most people who live in the world, Christmas is the time to eat pork, Pascha to eat lamb, and the carnival at the beginning of Lent, the time to throw confetti. But for the true monks, every week is Holy Week. Every Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday they experience Holy and Great Wednesday, Holy and Great Thursday, and Holy and Great Friday. That is the days of the Passion of Christ, and, and every Sunday is for them Pascha, the day of the resurrection. Why must we wait until Holy Week to remember the Passion of Christ? Why should we be like people who live in the world? Can't we realize what Christ is risen means without eating lamb? You see, Christ said, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. He did not say, Get ready right now. From the moment Christ said, Be ready, we must all, but especially monks and nuns, be constantly vigilant and ready. We must study and live through these divine events all the time. When someone studies the events of each feast day, he will naturally move to pray with particular reverence. Then, during liturgical services, our mind will, will be absorbed by the events we are celebrating, and we will follow with great reverence the chanting of hymns. When our mind thinks divine thoughts, we get to live through these holy events, and in this manner we are transformed. We think of a saint for whom we have a special devotion, or of the saint whose feast day we are celebrating, and our mind rises higher toward heaven. And when we keep the saints in mind, they keep us in mind, too, and they come to our assistance. This is how we can start a friendship with them, one that will last forever. And so even though we may live alone, we will actually share our lives with everybody, with the saints, the angels, the whole world. Imagine being alone and feeling their company. This is the living presence of the saints who are God's children and will reach out to help us, their poor brothers and sisters. Our saints have shed blood, sweat, and tears for the love of Christ. We should always celebrate them with reverence, and they will be there to help us. Every time we hear their Sanaxarion, on this same day we commemorate Saint and so on, we must rise to our feet like soldiers standing at attention when the names of their fallen comrades who have died heroically are being read. On this day of the month, soldier so-and-so fell in action, heroically defending the country in such and such a front, and so on. If we want to really feel the significance of a feast day, we must abstain from all work. On Holy and Great Friday, for instance, the only thing we should be doing is praying. For people who live in the world, Holy Week is full of chores and obligations. On Holy and Great Friday, they will exchange good wishes. Happy Easter, may, may you live a long life. May your son find a good bride. This is so wrong. On Holy and Great Friday, I will lock myself in my cell. Silence will be of great help to the soul during feast days. It's very much like the time that follows the reception of the great schema, when a monk or nun will spend a whole week in silence to allow divine grace to fill the soul and to appreciate what has actually taken place. In silence, we get the opportunity to rest a little, to study and pray. 
When a good thought crosses our mind, when we examine ourselves or say the Jesus prayer, we will really come to feel something of the divine event celebrated on that day. Better is a little that the righteous has. Psalm 37, verse 16. It is unfortunate that in our days we don't use freedom to do good and become holy. Instead, we use freedom to become more secular. In the past, people would work all week and rest on Sunday, a holy day. Now they rest on Saturday as well. But are their lives more spiritual? Or are they more sinful? If people spent their time on spiritual work, prayer, spiritual study, and so forth, things could have been different. People would live more conservative and decent lives. But we poor human beings try to rob time from the spiritual things, from Christ. People who live in the world will arrange to do all their heavily, heavy chores on Sundays. They are trying to find one Sunday for this chore, a holy day for another, and that's how they bring God's wrath on themselves. But why would the saints then come to their assistance? Turn Sunday into a chore day? Never. Even if others offered to help us on that day, we should never accept it, not on a Sunday. We will not allow God to be in charge. And so everything that we do without faith in God has nothing to do with him. It belongs to the world. It does not have his blessing, and for this reason the outcome is never good. When this happened, we like to say, it's the devil's fault. Well, not really. It's not the devil's fault, but ours, for not letting God help us. When we work on holy days, we give the devil rights, and then he gets involved in our affairs. The psalm reads, Better is a little that the righteous has than the abundance of many wicked. This is the kind of life that will receive a blessing. The rest is as worthy as shavings. But in order to live this way, we must have faith, philotimo, and reverence, and put God in charge of our lives. Otherwise, we'll never get the job right, whether it is on holy days or on weekdays, and we'll end up spending our time on nonsense. And you'll see that God will never abandon you. I have never worked on a Sunday or a feast day, and God has never left my side and has always blessed my work. I remember once some threshing machines were brought to the village and my father was notified that they could start on Sunday from our fields and then move downhill to the other lots. My father said to me, what should we do? The machines are here. There is no way I will work on Sunday, I replied. We can do it on Monday. But, my father objected, if we miss this opportunity, we'll have such a hard time threshing with the horses. That's fine with me, I said. If I have to, I'll be threshing all the way to Christmas. So I went to church anyway, without giving the matter any more thought. Well, as the machines started coming toward our field, they broke down. Forgive us, but the machines won't work. We'll have to take them to Yaeni and fix them. And when we come back on Monday, you'll be the first in line. So instead of threshing on Sunday, they ended up threshing on Monday. I've seen this kind of thing happen so many times. If monks won't observe feast days, what are lay people supposed to do? How different was the spirit of monasticism in the old days? I remember how lay people who celebrated the feast of the Holy Cross according to the new calendar would come to the Holy Mountain after the feast and bring us grapes. Sometimes, the day they arrived, we would be celebrating the Feast of the Holy Cross according to our calendar. But the fathers would never go to unload the boat on such a day. They would send them back or just leave them there, both the boat and the grapes. They would do the same if an olive oil or wood shipment would arrive, would happen to arrive on the day of a feast. And the monasteries were poor. The monks were thinking, what will people say if they see monks working on this day? They would rather have a storm take the load and lose the oil and the grapes than to go and unload the ship, miss the feast, and scandalize souls. Not so today. I happened to be at a monastery on the eve of a feast day, and the monks were unloading grapes. The entire cenobium later gathered together to squeeze them. That night they were supposed to have a vigil, 
but they decided to postpone it and transfer it to another time, and that was a major feast. In the case of need, even a law may be transferred. In another place, they were repairing a monastery damaged by fire on a Sunday. Just wait, it will burn down again. When people who live in the world see these things, they naturally say to themselves, feast days mean nothing anymore. We monks should be especially careful not to work on feast days, not only because doing so is a sin, but because we also become a cause for scandal. We sin twice. People who live in the world are looking for an excuse to justify their sins. They may be working day and night and never observing the feasts. But let them see a monk or nun working on some emergency, and the devil will whisper to them, Hey, take a look. If priests work, why not you? A nun may be seen simply airing a blanket on a Sunday, and if people see her, they'll think, Well, if nuns are working, what's wrong with us going to work? That's why we need to be very careful. We don't want to cause a scandal. Yerunda, what if a workman wants to work on a feast day, let's say on the entrance of the Theotokos to the temple? To work in the monastery on the feast day of the entrance of the Theotokos in the temple? No, that's not right. He should not be allowed to work. Yerunda, this actually did happen. One of the sisters did not think of telling the workman to come another day. Then the sister needs to be given a canona. Footnote, a, a canon, the, the dis discipline imposed by a spiritual father upon the believing sinner in the context of the mystery of repentance for his or her correction. Such discipline could take the form of fasting, almsgiving, prayer, abstinence from Holy Communion for a specified period of time, and so on. To continue... Yarunda, on a feast day after the vigil's over, if one becomes sleepy, can they do some handiwork while saying the Jesus prayer? Can't she do prostrations? Let her do prostrations to overcome her sleepiness. Why do handiwork? How about on, on Sunday? Is it right to weave a kumboskini after a sister has performed her spiritual duties? Why should you weave a kumboskini? Why not enjoy this day's spiritual nourishment? Unfortunately, the spirit of the world is entering our monasteries. From what I hear, there are monasteries where on Sunday afternoons or in the afternoon of a feast day, they will return to their chores and duties. As if they have children that are dying from hunger or owe heavy debts that will force them to auction their house. Where's the need? Of course, it's different with the monk or nun who serves the visitors or the cooks who serve in the kitchen. Someone needs to be there to do the necessary work. Sometimes people bring me fish. Take it and go away, I tell them. What will happen if people start bringing a live fish here, a dead fish there? If someone brings you fish here in the monastery on a feast day, you would have to clean and cook it and so on. How will you be able to enjoy the feast day? Do you remember Father Minas and the skeet of St. Anna? A fisherman brought him fish on a Sunday morning for the feast day. They're fresh, Yerunda, he said. Today is Sunday. When did you catch them? And they're so fresh, he replied, puzzled. This morning, the man answered. Throw them away, son. They're anathematized. Father Minas responded, And if you want to make sure that I'm telling you the truth, give one to the cat and see if it will eat it. And indeed, the fisherman threw the cat a fish, but the animal turned its head away with repulsion. That's how sensitive monks were in those days. Now, on great feast days, you'll see monasteries full of workers and technicians. Once on the Feast of the Theotokos in August, a monastery had a whole crew working with chainsaws in the forest, gathering wood. Even though it was a clear day, suddenly it got cloudy, and lightning struck just next to the woodcutters, who were so terrified that they left without even notifying anyone that the forest was on fire. It took them forever to put out the fire. The following Sunday, two woodcutters cutting crews went out again. These fires are God's wrath because we have turned Sundays and feast days into working days. And the sad thing is that we don't realize what we are doing. We are pushing God's tolerance and patience to its limits. If there is a need for something, the monks will pray, saying the Jesus Prayer 100 times each, and God will enlighten someone to send them 
100,000 drachmas. The monk's job is prayer. If we don't put out trust in God, who will? Those who live in the world? God feels obligated to hear the prayer of the monk who has entrusted his life to him. When I lived in the Cenobium, there was a monk who assisted the abbot. He was not quick at all. In fact, he never left before the Divine Liturgy ended, and yet he always managed to finish all his chores. I, on the other hand, who was quicker and left before the liturgy ended to prepare the assembly room, would be running into all kinds of problems. Sometimes I would mishandle the coffee beaker, and the coffee would spill all over. Other times I would drop the cups and the glasses. Something would always go wrong. But he would wait until the end of the liturgy. He would cross himself and trust in God to help him. If he were ever reprimanded, he would accept it with humility. He was humble and benefited twice as much. When we don't get stuck on unimportant details, which would cause no harm if omitted, we will benefit twice as much from whatever good we do and give to the saints, whose feast we celebrate, double the praise they're due. We should try to do the best of our ability not to devote ourselves to work at the expense of our spiritual life, which should always come first. This way, no matter what job we do, we'll have the blessing of God. It's our spiritual life that must come first, not material things. If we put our work ahead of everything else and put prayer in second place, this means that for us work is more important than prayer. It is pride and irreverence that lie behind this attitude. The work of the spiritually bankrupt cannot be sanctified. If we put spiritual matters first, God will take care of the rest. When we monks don't observe feast days, what are lay people supposed to do? If we don't do our spiritual work and plead with the saints to help us, who will? What happens is that we end up saying all the time that we believe in God, but in reality, we don't even trust in Him. If we monks and nuns who wear the monastic cassock will not respect the canons of the church and violate and dishonor her age-old traditions, what possible meaning can our lives have? Calamities befall those who work on Sundays and feast days. Normally, we must cease all work before the vespers of Sunday or of a feast day. If arrangements can be made, it is better to work more on the previous day and avoid any work after the vespers of a festal celebration. It is a different matter if, in the event of an emergency, some light tasks need to be taken care of in the afternoon of a Sunday or a feast day. But even in such cases, the work should be done with discretion. In the old days, when farmers out in the fields heard the church bells announcing vespers, they would do the sign of the cross and cease all work. The women of the neighborhood would do the same. They would stand up, cross themselves, and stop knitting or anything else they were doing, and God would bless them. They had their health and enjoyed life. Now they have abolished the feast days, distanced themselves from God and the church, and not surprisingly end up spending all the money they earn on doctors and hospitals. Once a man came to my cell and said, my boy, gets sick very often and doctors cannot figure out what's wrong with him. Stop working on Sundays and things will change, I told him. He followed my advice and his little boy recovered. I always tell people that if they want to avoid calamities in their life, they should stop working on Sundays and feast days. Work schedules could be arranged to keep these days free. Where there is spiritual sensitivity, everything is possible solutions will be found. That's really the issue here. Even if a particular solution is to our disadvantage and we suffer a loss, in the end we'll be twice blessed. But so many people fail to understand this. They do not even attend the Divine Liturgy. The Divine Liturgy sanctifies. If a Christian will not go to church on Sunday, how will he be sanctified? It's unfortunate, but the way things are going, people will do away with feast days and with everything else. You see, they're even changing their names and are forgetting their saints whose name they bear. If they are named Vasiliki, they change it to Vicky, Zoe to Zozo, which 
Sounds like saying zo or animal twice. They've come up with new feasts. Mother's Day, May Day, April Fool's Day. Pretty soon they'll say today is Artichoke Day, tomorrow Cyprus Day, later the birthday of the inventor of the atomic bomb, and of soccer, and so on. But God will not abandon us. Chapter 4, The Orthodox Tradition Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Hebrews 13, verse 8. Yeronda, people often talk about church renewal as if the church is getting old and needs to be rejuvenated. The church getting old? Not quite. If you have a bit of piety and some good sense, you will not find satisfaction in novelties. This is why we see some people return to an antiquity. They cannot, for example, be touched by modern icons because they realize the value that an old icon has. And this only takes a bit of good sense. Now, imagine if in addition to that, one has real piety. This should tell you how wrong they are who are calling for renewal and for all kinds of changes. Today, even those who try to remain faithful to tradition, who fast, abstain from work on Sundays and feast days, and are generally pious, are subjected to ridicule. This fellow is out of touch. He lives in the past. And if you dare say something, they'll go on. You're totally out of it. We don't do things this way anymore. And soon enough, tradition and fasting and piety are turned into myths and fairy tales. But do you remember what the gospel says? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. There are those who cannot be faithful to tradition. The least they can do is to say, Forgive me, Lord, I have sinned, and God will be merciful. But that's not what happens. The piety and devotion of others make them aware of their own weaknesses, and they try to impose their way to make up for that. It's like taking a possessed person and putting him in a spiritual environment. He will not be able to sit still or find rest because he will be under pressure. Something similar happens in this case. These people are checked by their conscience. They know something is wrong and try to suppress it. And so they come up with all these remarks. They take old values and call them status quo and try to replace moral order with disorder. People act in perverse ways. When they see spiritual beauty, they take it as ugliness. Spiritual beauty becomes, for them, secular ugliness. Take, for example, a monk and cut his hair and beard short. You'll see how ugly he will look. Well, those who have a secular mind will not see that. They will find him beautiful. Just turn around and see how they fight the church and try to destroy her. Let's say that they don't believe in God and what they preach is atheism. But why do they refuse to recognize the many good things that the church has to offer and are always against her? This is really malicious. Why don't they acknowledge that the church actually protects children, keeps them from turning into little hooligans, and teaches them to become good human beings? What these people do is exactly the opposite. They push children on an evil path. They give them free license to destroy themselves. And what does the church teach? It teaches them to be prudent, to show respect to other people, and to be chaste, and grow up to be good and wholesome human beings. But this will not last. Things will come around. In Russia, in a church, an old lady was praying on her knees next to a pillar. A young woman, a great scientist, goes up to her and says, All these are old-fashioned. And the old woman turns to her and replies, Right here, at this very pillar where you now see me weeping, you too will weep one day. The things of your world will come and go, and one day it too will come to pass. But Christianity will never go away. It shall never come to pass. Respect for Tradition when holy martyrs did not know how to explain the doctrines of the church, they would often say, What I believe is what the holy fathers have taught. That was enough to lead them to martyrdom. You see, they could not defend their faith with arguments and persuade those that persecuted them. 
but they trusted the Holy Fathers. He would reason to himself, how can I not trust the Holy Fathers? They are far more experienced and virtuous and holy than we are. How can I accept this nonsense and not protest when people insult the Holy Fathers? We must trust holy tradition. The problem today is that so many embrace European courtesy and try to appear nice. They want to be viewed as open-minded and tolerant and end up bowing to the two-horned devil. We don't need many religions, they say. One universal religion will do. This they, they, they want to level everything. Some of my visitors actually think this way. Those of us who believe in Christ should form one religion, they once told me. What you are suggesting, I replied, is that we take 18 karat gold that has been purified and separated from copper and mix it with copper again. Does this make any sense? Ask a jeweler, does it make sense to mix base metals with gold? So many have struggled to keep our orthodox dogma pure and make it shine. The Holy Fathers were right to forbid relations with heretics, but today people don't see that. We should pray together with the heretic, the Buddhist, the fire worshiper, even the demon worshiper, they say. The Orthodox should participate in joint conferences and prayer sessions. It's important that we're present. What kind of presence are they talking about? They try to approach everything with logic and end up justifying the unjustifiable. If we follow the European spirit, we'll end up putting spiritual matters under a common market. A few among the Orthodox who are rather superficial individuals seeking self-promotion in a self-appointed mission organize conferences with the heterodox to create a stir. They are supposedly promoting orthodoxy, but all they do is bring in the heterodox and make a mixed salad. This gets the superzealots angry, and they go to the other extreme. They blaspheme against the mysteries of the new calendar orthodox, and so on, and thoroughly scandalize souls who are full of devotion and orthodox sensitivity. The heterodox, on the other hand, come to these conferences, behave, behave as if we all have to learn from them, and then take whatever good spiritual material they find in orthodoxy, process it in their lab, add their own color and label it, and present it as an original idea. And there are all kinds of strange people who are moved by such ventures and end up spiritually damaged. The time will come, however, when the Lord will bring forth great figures like St. Mark, the Eugenicos, and St. Gregory Palamas. They will gather together all our scandalized brothers and sisters to confess the Orthodox faith and secure the Orthodox tradition, bringing great joy to the Mother Church. If we lived in the spirit of the Church Fathers, we would be full of spiritual health and become the envy of the heterodox. They would then abandon their ill-conceived beliefs and be saved without the need of preaching. As things stand now, our patristic tradition does not move them because what they are looking for is continuity. They want to see in us the presence of that spirit, a living relationship to our saints. It's the duty of all the Orthodox to give the heterodox good reason to wonder, to lead them to realize their errors so that they don't find rest in false beliefs. This way they will not be deprived of the many blessings of orthodoxy in this life and of the abundant and eternal blessings of God in the next. A group of young Catholic men that came to my cell, they were very eager and interested to learn more about orthodoxy. Please tell us something that will help us spiritually, they said. Look, I replied, go and take a look at church history and you will see how in the past we were united and then you took your own way and ended up where you are. Do this and you will be helped. When you're done, come back and we'll have plenty to talk about. In the old days, people had respect for what they inherited. They would hold on to their grandparents' belongings. I had come to know this very successful lawyer. His house was simple. Not only family, but also visitors felt at ease there. Once he said to me, Father, a few years ago, my friends would make fun of my old furniture. Now they come and admire them as antiques. 
but I don't see them like that. I enjoy using them because they remind me of my father, my mother, my grandparents. I am really moved by them. To my friends, however, it's an entirely different matter. They collect old furniture and turn their living rooms into antique shops, and this somehow helps them forget and cope with life's stress. In the past, one would inherit a tiny gold coin from his mother or grandfather, and he would treasure it, as if it were worth a great fortune. Today, if someone has a King George pound and the exchange rate with a Victoria pound is slightly better, he'll sell it to make the difference. There is no appreciation, no consideration for the things that belonged to his mother or father. Add the influence of the European spirit and you can see how all of us are being slowly slept, swept away. When I first went to the Holy Mountain, I met a very old and pious man who was the elder of a small fellowship of monks. Such was his reverence for his own elders and spiritual predecessors that he would keep everything they passed on to him. Thus he kept not only their monastic head coverings, but also the forms used to make them. He also kept old books and manuscripts of all kinds, carefully wrapped and locked in a book bookcase to protect them from dust. I am not worthy to read these books, he would say. I just read the simple books, the Yerondikon, St. John the Ladder. One day this young monk came to stay with him. He eventually left the holy mountain. He would tell him things like, what are you going to do with all this junk? He wanted to throw away the casts or burn them. The poor old man started weeping. This one is from my Yeronda, he would plead. Why are you bothered by it? We have so many rooms, can't you find a corner to put them? He was so full of reverence for his elder that he kept everything, the books, the heirlooms, the head coverings, even these worn-out casts. You see, if we have respect for the small things, we will respect the big things even more. But where small things are not respected, big things will not be respected either. This is how the Holy Fathers preserved the tradition of the Church. Retain the time-tested practices of monasticism. Yaranda, when a sister who is new to a post finds a certain order in the way things are arranged, is it right for her to make changes? No, she should not start by making any changes, even if she is the only person working in that post. Some of the new brotherhoods who moved into old monasteries did that. They did not respect the old-timers' experience. When people try to come up with their own programs and discard the old typica, the time-tested rules that helped regulate monastic life, they not only show a lack of tradition, but what is worse, they show disrespect for tradition. Of course, eventually they will come to realize how useful these rules are. They were put there to serve a purpose. The rules and time-old practices of monasticism are carefully weighed. They reflect centuries of experience. You see, we must respect the rules that govern a craft. I was a carpenter, and I, I know that a regular table is 80 centimeters high and a step is 27 centimeters wide. These are proven measures, and an, and an apprentice must accept them as they are. We don't need to explain them to him. They are the result of experience, and we must trust the craftsman and respect his expertise. People who don't respect the rules of a craft will not do their job right. They're going to end up making a table which is either too low or too high. I have changed many different cell locations. This makes me... It's hut burner, a play of Kafso Caliviatis, a monk who constructs for him a cell, a hut from leaves and branches, lives in it for a time and then burns it and moves to another location. See the life of St. Maximus Kafso Calivitis. To continue... Each time I made changes in the doors or the hooks, I realized that things had been there for a good reason. This is why whenever I move to a new place, I don't make any changes, even if I am uncomfortable with my surroundings. I won't even remove a single nail from the wall. The father who was there before me put the nails there for a reason. If I, with no experience of the place, start taking them out, I will eventually have to put them back in the same spot and will ruin the plaster. Nails are there for a reason. 
to hang a sweater, a cassock. Once I went to live in the Kili of St. Hypatios in Katanakia, and I found thick walking sticks with curved ends on all corners. At first I used them to give them out to people who came to visit me, but later I realized that the father who had lived there before me used the sticks to catch the snakes that would enter the room. There were many snakes, and he wanted to have a stick handy every time he saw one. The most important thing is to hold on to time-tested things. Otherwise, tradition goes away and transgression sets in. Tradition and transgression. There's a huge difference between the two. Some would like us to make a tradition out of transgression. There are monasteries today who do as they please and consider themselves traditional when in fact they are transgressional. Now, how can there be spiritual discernment without spiritual sensitivity? You see, in monasticism, we must follow a different rule, not a military rule or the rule of a movement, a cooperative and so on, but the time-tested rule of a monasticism, the rule set by the Holy Fathers. People will often use the term patristic as their own theoretical understanding of monasticism and the Fathers, but this in reality is a pseudo-rule. The conception of those who have only read patristic writings but not lived them. Some new monasteries today resemble charitable institutions. The only excuse I can think of is that when they started, they found very little in the manner of a foundation. Still, they could have sought the advice of older monasteries. When Ottoman rule was over, the first monasteries had no spiritual foundation. The Bavarians, who came to rule Greece under King Otto, tried to em emulate them, eliminate them, and confiscate their property. They even issued a decree that monks should get married, an effective way to dismantle monastic communities. That was one problem. We, on the other hand, failed to search for past examples and see how monasticism was practiced in our tradition. People, for, for instance, noticed that monasteries had cows, calves, and so on. And they concluded, that's what monasticism is all about, raising cattle. But the reason that monasteries kept animals was because during Ottoman rule, people would donate their livestock and property to monasteries to keep them from falling into the hands of the Turks. It was to the monasteries that the people would go to find food and shelter and support from all sorts of difficulties and dangers. It was there in the holy monasteries that the people, especially the poor and the suffering, would find help and consolation. There were no charitable institutions at that time, and so monks had to take care of both animals and people. Later, things changed and monasteries retained only one of these practices. They continued to raise farm animals. There were some among the spiritual men of that period that concluded, this unfortunately is our monastic tradition. And they went looking to Western models of monasticism, borrowing from them the whole idea of missionary work. They did not go back to our tradition to check, neither did they reason. Well, that's what Ottoman rule bequeathed to us. Monks could not live an authentic monastic life under those circumstances. What we see is a remnant of this unhealthy situation. It's now time to go back to our true tradition. But instead of going back to our tradition, they went back to a Western model. They sought examples from that direction and tried to apply them here. This is the mistake they made. They did not go back to our tradition. You see, the Turks had great respect for the religious charitable foundations because they often benefited from our saints. They would even witness miracles and visit our monasteries seeking God's help rather than mere hospitality. They will go back to tradition. Christians are holding on to their faith to the honor of the church and they recognize her grandeur. The day will come when others will appreciate their dedication. You'll see people will start going back to, tradi to tradition. That's exactly what happened with Orthodox iconography. There was a time when Byzantine art was not properly understood and frescoes in many churches were hammered away. People sought to get rid of the old plaster and replaced it with painted Renaissance style images. 
Now, after all these years, the value of Orthodox iconography is widely recognized. Old frescoes are uncovered and restored by people who are not necessarily motivated by piety or belief in God. Some of them are atheists. The same will happen with us. The things that we discard today as useless will be sought by others in the future. Have you noticed how Byzantine music is making a comeback? Even young children are now studying it. A few years ago, you would have had a hard time finding people trained in Byzantine music. But now when they see young children studying it, many begin to wander. Oh, the sweet turns of Byzantine music. When it's authentic Byzantine, they are so beautiful, so very sweet. Footnote, the elder used the word grismata to refer to the stylistic turns, that is, the vocal melodic patterns or variations of Byzantine music, which are usually indicated with the characters of quality or expression and which contribute to the adornment and beauty of the melodies. To continue... Some sound as fine as the voice of the nightingale, others as soft like lapping waves, and yet others are full of grandeur. Everything is meant to stress and convey divine truths. But such chanting is hard to find. Most people will sing halfway in bits and pieces in stylized ways. There are gaps in their singing, holes. And worst of all, they will chant without inflection. Can't they read the marks on their books? It's like modern grammar that has done away with accent marks, and so people's reading has become flat. No matter what they say, it sounds the same, as if the words have been steamrolled, flat. Panizo, panizo, you hear them chant, but nothing comes, comes of it. Some will stress a tone, but without emotion, and end up shrieking. Others will stress a tone so hard and do that with every tone, as if they're hammering nails rather than chanting. It's true. Their chanting is either too harsh or too flat. When you hear them, you don't feel anything inside. You are not moved. Now take authentic Byzantine music. It's so peaceful. It soothes the soul. To chant right, our inner spiritual condition must be right. It is then that what reaches our ears is divine bliss. Christ fills the heart and the heart rejoices and we turn and speak to God with a heart full of joy. And when we chant from the heart, our heart is transformed. We feel the change, and so do others around us. Some years ago, an experienced chanter visited the Holy Mountain, and he ended up getting really embarrassed. The fathers there chanted in the traditional way. So they invited him to chant with them, but he could not sing the turns. He did not know how. But for the fathers... The Hagiarites, that was common knowledge. When he left, he started thinking about his chanting. Same thing happened to other chanters, so they became concerned. They did their research, studied, listened to old traditional masters, and learned all about the turns that chanters used in the past. When the Turks arrived in Asia Minor, they found Byzantine music and adopted it. This is why Turkish Amanides is a slow, mellow song from Anatolia, which often repeats the word aman, an explanation suggestive of pain, anguish, and suffering. To continue, this is why this Turkish Amanides are so moving, and our people have this saying, when you sing, sing in Turkish. When you speak, speak in French. When you write, write in Greek. I am not saying that all Turks sing this way or have great voices, but when they sing, they, they put their heart in it. They sing with feeling and emotion. But some of our people have no idea that the Amanides are of Byzantine origin, and they say that our Byzantine music was influenced by Turks. But the Turks, when they came from the depths of Asia, had neither music nor anything else, and so they borrowed the music of Byzantium. Yet on the, how can Catholics find the organ spiritually satisfying? How? Well, they wanted popular music. That's the answer. Remember those Catholic nuns in France who were singing Christ is Risen and were dancing to modern music with an icon in their hands? In their mind, they were celebrating Pascha. 
It was their abbess who was carrying the icon. It was renewal they wanted, and look what, what that got them. I remember once I heard this young monk chant a doxology, and it sounded a bit strange. Wait a minute, I thought to myself, what is he chanting? So I asked him, who composed this doxology? Petros, the Peloponnesian, he replied. But I have made some corrections. You have made corrections, I asked. Well, yes, don't I have the right to do that? Was his response. Sure, you have the right to compose your own doxology, I said to him. But you don't have the right to destroy someone else's. I am sure he would make these changes and then claim, it's from the holy mountain. We need to be very careful not to dilute our holy tradition. If people want to, they can compose their own chants. Put their name on it. That's their right. But they cannot take old chants and dilute them. That's irreverence. It's like someone with no knowledge of iconography trying to restore an old icon. He's free to paint his own icon, but not to destroy someone else's. Take faith away and the world will crumble. Many had been in favor of abolishing religion because they believed that religion is the cause of all our troubles. But now they've come to realize that if faith is taken away from man, he turns into a beast. Nothing can restrain him. Take away ideals and man will crumble. A journalist once visited an old communist politician and asked him, what must our politicians do today to succeed? And what must they avoid if they don't want to fail? And he replied, the reasons we have failed is because we went after the church. That is to say, communists who do not believe, who have neither a materialistic interest nor a spiritual aspiration, realize that they cannot go against God. In some parts of Serbia, this was said in June of 1985, they have started building churches because they noticed that where there are churches, there are fewer cases of mental illness, lower crime, etc. It's not out of faith that they have built them, but out of expediency. Instead of medicating people, they're making churches for them. Even the famous Romanian dictator, a shame, shameful man, would preach against Christianity, calling it the opiate of the people, but still admit that Christians are good people. When human beings believe in God, they live orderly lives and don't create trouble. It's those who don't believe in anything that will resort to violence. Russia will give us many saints. People are now turning against communism, and communists try to justify its crimes. Lenin and Marx, they explain, agreed with the ideas of Christ, but could not understand his spirit fully, and that's why they committed crimes and so on. They are trying to deal with Christian unrest. Christians in these countries are demanding we want to return to our tradition, to our orthodox faith. And they must conform to this request, because otherwise the public will turn against them. So they echo this demand. Let's return to our old ways, our tradition. If you were to believe them, the reason they committed all these crimes during the Russian Revolution was because they had not understood properly the spirit of Christ's teachings. A day will come when those who govern, even if they themselves have no faith, will realize that if religion is not brought back, human society will crumble. In fact, they will impose some religion on people to create order and make governing easier. In the future, those that skip their prayers even for a day will be sent to prison. The state will hold us accountable. In time, eventually, things will come around to their proper position. We must leave a good legacy. Yananda, why is it that in some parts of Greece one will find a large number of good people? Well, probably because good people lived there once and built a good legacy, and others are now following in their footsteps. It's not the soil that makes the difference. You see, when a certain town or region creates a good tradition or even a bad one, a legacy is left. Up in Epirus, there was a village near the Albanian border where the villagers would attend every single service, Vespers, the Divine Liturgy, even a Polipnan, small compline. It was as if they already lived in heaven. It was a heavenly life on earth that will continue for them in heaven. 
And so they not only helped themselves, but future generations as well, by bequeathing to them a good legacy. This is something that can be inherited. People find it ready, waiting for them, and carry on with it. Now, there was another village nearby where people had the habit of stealing. Even their priest, the only priest that ever came from that place, would steal icons from the church. So it was not the soil that was to blame, but the people's bad habits. This is what they passed on to their other generations, even up to this day. It will take a lot of hard work to change things there and create a good legacy. It's interesting, isn't it, that when someone has a bad character, people will try and persuade you that he is not really from their town, that he is somehow a stranger to their part of the world. But take a saint and everybody wants to claim him as their own. Take, for instance, Saint Cosmas at Telos. He comes from the southern part of Greece. But people here in Epirus call him Epirite because his father was born in a village at the Gramanacoria of Epirus. No matter what the facts are and what a saint wants, people will try to claim him as their own. I met a family man once who used to move one of his fingers nervously every time he spoke. His kids would do the exact same thing when they spoke. Children will imitate their parents' habits, and they will copy them exactly. What matters the most is that they copy the good things, otherwise bad habits will be passed on and perpetuated. I remember this man who had entered an idiorhythmic monastery to become a monk, but did not feel at ease there. Stay a while, my son, and things will change his elder would advise him. Yerunda, how is that possible? His, his son replied. The disciple of elder so-and-so is exactly like his elder, and the disciple of that other elder is exactly like him, so how will things ever change? When there is a bad habit in a monastery or in a community, and young monks show little concern and just go about copying what they see, they end up perpetuating what is wrong. If, on the other hand, they show appropriate concern, then it's possible for a bad practice to change and be replaced with something good. This way, both good and bad habits can be perpetuated. What I have come to realize is that all the things that have come down to us, either from the Holy Fathers or from the Tipica, the ancient rules and practices, are like remnants of the harvest. It is so important for us to be careful and make sure that we hold on to the yeast for future use. This is our Christian responsibility. We have no right to leave behind a bad legacy. A few years ago in Geneva, there was a gathering of theologians and university professors in preparation for a synod. This was said in 1992. Noting that most people don't observe the fasts of Christmas, the Nativity, of the Holy Apostles and the Great Lent, they recommended doing away with the first two and reducing the Great Lent fast by two weeks. Some professors from Greece were also at this conference. When they came and told me about their recommendations, I was very upset. I was beside myself. Don't you realize what you're doing? I said to them. If someone is sick, he's allowed to eat. There's no rule against it. If someone is not sick, but breaks the fast out of weakness, all he needs to do is humble himself Forgive me, Lord, he should say, I have sinned. Christ will not hang him alive for breaking the fast. If he is not sick, however, he should not break it. Of course, there are also those who don't care about fasting to begin with, so everything falls into place. But if we do away with the fasts in order to please those who don't care to keep them, what is going to happen with future generations? It could be that they will be better than us in observing the fasts. But still, what right do we have to do away with them, especially since they pose no problems? Catholics only fast for one hour before Holy Communion. Are we going to follow in that spirit, blessing our weaknesses and our falls? We don't have the right to fashion Christianity according to our weaknesses. Even if those who observe the fasts are few in number, we should still keep the order of the church. If someone is sick, he should take his food say yogurt, and eat it at home, where others cannot see and be scandalized. A fellow said to me, this is hypocritical. What do you mean, I replied. 
Should you go and sin in the town square in order to be honest? You see how the devil presents things to them. We want to create our own orthodoxy according to our own standards and interpret the fathers and the gospel as we please. Today, when we have so many highly educated Orthodox men and women, Orthodoxy should be a light to the world. Look at St. Nicodemus the Hagiorite. One single man accomplished so much. He wrote so many books, all the Synaxarian of the saints, entire libraries he knew by heart, and all that without photocopying machines and computers. We should strive hard to be true Christians. This is how we will develop a spiritual sense and come to feel pain in our hearts for orthodoxy and our homeland and fulfill our obligations to our Hellenic nation and heritage. This is the foundation. If we are true Christians, we will care about everything that affects the church. We will worry and pray for her good. We should not wait for people to coax us. Now you should care about this, later for that, and so on. If we leave it to others, we will resemble a square wheel that will never turn on its own and will need to be pushed all the time. The point is to turn on our own. Then our turns will be beautiful and smooth like those of a well-rounded wheel. And if this happens, we will feel the movement coming from within, and God will inform our soul about many things, more than an educated person can ever reach on his own. It won't be just the written things that we will know, but also the thoughts in the minds of those who write them. Do you see what I am saying? This is the work of divine illumination, and all of man's activities are enlightened. How can we abandon the legacy that Christ left for us? We don't have the right to do away with it. God will hold us accountable. You see, this small nation of ours believed in the Messiah, and God gave us the blessing to enlighten the whole world. The Old Testament was translated into Greek 100 years before the coming of Christ. Think of how the first Christians suffered. Their lives were constantly at risk. Nowadays, there's so much indifference, and yet it would, it would be so easy for us to enlighten other nations today. We owe the peace we enjoy today to those who came before us. Do you know how many of our ancestors sacrificed their lives? We owe everything we have to them. I compare them with us. They keep their faith even though their lives were in danger. Our lives are not at stake, but we let go of our faith, and in return we destroy all that they have bequeathed us. Those who have never had the experience of being subjugated to another nation do not appreciate my advice. May God protect us from barbarian invaders and their wrath. I tell them why they reply, what's going to happen to us. Listen to their attitude. Oh, why don't they go away? That's the kind of people you run into these days. Give them money and cars. That's what matters. They couldn't care less about faith, honor, or even their own liberty. We Greeks, the Hellenic nation, owe our Orthodox Christian faith to Christ and to the holy martyrs, and fathers of our church. We owe our liberty to the heroes of our homeland who shed their blood for us. And so we owe it to them to keep this holy legacy alive and not let it disappear or destroy it ourselves. What a great shame it would be if our nation perished. And just as in war, individuals are drafted to serve their country, so too in our days God is sending personal invitations to people drafting them to safeguard and save his creature. God will not abandon us, but we need to do our part too. We need to do what is humanly possible, and for the rest, turn to God and pray for his help. End of Volume 1, Elder Paisios of Manathos Spiritual Counsels with Pain and Love for Contemporary Man.